everyone. Uh, we're gonna go fully live in like five minutes. I just wanted to do a uh, little pre-warning like I often do uh, when I'm the one hosting Red Planet that this is a Red Planet episode hosted by me, Sophie, on my channel. And uh, that means that things might be a little spicy. Uh, we're working on making things less spicy uh, no, matter, no matter who is hosting. Uh, Conrad is, like, fucking paddling away in his little hamster wheel that powers the producing machine, and things will improve. <laughs> but, uh, welcome back to Red Planet. This is my new face. <laughs> uh, I will be chatting as much as I can, handling all of the technical stuff, um, and I, I hope we have a good show. I will be properly live in, like, five minutes. I apologize in advance for everything that always happens on a Sophie episode of Red Planet. Okay.
Whoa, what the? F Whoa. Yeah, hello. <laughs> it's all going Whoa. so well already. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Well, I mean, like, look, here's the thing, yeah. I'm here. I'm, I've got hot water bottle on my lap. Right? Oh, yeah. And I'm, you know, trying I'm to do the go scene. Tell me more. Tweet. Uh, <laughs> I've got a very, very wet, hot lap. Okay. That's what's going on. Right. I will. Yeah, I will. You know, I. Uh... That's that. I see what I, I I see what DJ Mule is doing, and I encourage him to go even mm. further. I am currently that's a little Keir Starmer reference for the non breds um, <laughs> I am currently sitting on an electric blanket. Um, Ooh. Ooh! This is a big shout out to any dolls watching because like estrogen has made me feel the cold so much more. <laughs> like a couple of winters ago, I was like talking to Nat, and she was like, "It's it's fucking freezing," and I was like, "No, you don't understand." I feel how cold it is right now, but I feel it so much more than I've... Like, you're cold. I'm the coldest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> you're not used to it. <laughs> no, That's I'm not. The thing. No, I'm not. Yeah. And that has to be accounted for. It sucks. It <laughs> actually right. sucks. Uh, so I've got this little um, electric blanket, like, heat pad. And I've actually... I've bought three of them. And there's one that is in the living room. One that's in, in my bed. And then I've got one at my other partner's house for when I go over there. <laughs> That's how essential <laughs> this is. I need everyone to know about this. This is a public safety announcement for dolls only. <laughs> Hell yeah. We gotta do it. We gotta use our platform to uh, yeah, yeah. promote that shit, to be honest. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, well, um, everybody, wow. well, yeah. Uh, it's Red Planet number, <laughs> I don't know, 31 or something? I think I, it's I, 33. Uh, 33. 33. I just 33 realized is, yeah. there is no text thing. Oh, on my fuck. my setup for this. So that's well, Kira. We don't have no one knows who Kira is. Oh no. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. No, I, did, I I removed that because, you know, she's just she's just she's just gone. Who have you seen this streamer? Does anyone know who this is? Can we find have her? Have you seen this streamer? Uh And you uh encrypted. Um someone says I'm very loud. Am I very loud? You're you're somewhat loud, but I won't I won't In worry about character, it. Character, personality, you're a loud guy, you got lots of tattoos, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, you know, some people just aren't ready for that, Tim, and you have to If I smoked some Tim, that. I would be like, damn, that shit's loud. <laughs> That's loud. Um I <laughs> I'm adding a text source now. And my my apologies and everyone mark the Sophie's spicy technical management of the stream counter up to one. Um, Maybe, uh, yes. Yeah. Where? Oh my god. They've changed. Mule, they've changed Streamlabs. They changed it while I was away, and it's fucked I don't up know why now. You talk to me. I don't have Streamlabs. They changed it. it. Look, no, I, no. I tell everyone. I tell everyone to, I found uh, it. you know. Okay. Uh, there, okay, there you go. You it's got all right. It. There we go. It. All right. Sorted. Red oh, planet Tim, title. Image. <laughs> okay. I just t we we didn't we couldn't find the uh, the image for Kira when she can't make it, and so Tim made one on the fly rapid, uh, and this is just great. Like this is perfect. <laughs> made it on. Oh, um, so I didn't even. It wasn't even paint or anything. It was like imageflip.com. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard of that. Played with years. like maybe sunglasses or like red glowing eyes. But... God, that fucking owns. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. good. Okay, we now have the title of the episode. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, do I need to add a, a label for Kira who isn't here? You know what? I'll do it. I'll do it. Just to yeah. be nice. Yeah. Just to be nice. R.I.P. Binch. <laughs> right. And we've added that too. Let's do some news. Let's do some Let's do it. Let's bring up the news. Okay, cool. Um, um, so... Who wants to start? Does anyone want to start, Tim? You love doing the news. Uh, I don't know. I'll t I can tell you about some news. I'll, t I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, let's go. I'll start so you that go. I have to think less for the like round of news next. So, uh, <laughs> some, some old guy's painting got a little bit saucy, uh, is the news... <laughs> And, love a saucy painting. Um, I love when paintings are saucy. Personally, uh, it, I'm a big fan mm. of it. Um, uh, the real news is that the planet is on fire, and uh, yeah. people <laughs> don't really care uh, and aren't really reacting to it. Like you know, uh, a worthwhile uh, thing to be worried mm. about. Which I feel like maybe they should. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, Sophie, is that what you don't understand is that, like, these kids, uh, yeah. you know, they shouldn't have done this. What they should have done yeah. is they should have gone and, and blown up an oil rig. That's what everybody's saying. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, yeah. we don't advocate I mean, for anything like yeah, this yeah. <laughs> on Red Planet, but this yeah. is what most people are criticizing these literal children <laughs> for. Um, they shouldn't I... have thrown paint at something to make a statement. They should have. They should have literally... Uh, you know, done one well, of the I, most damaging hard things. To I will ever. say the like, uh, I saw someone's, I forget who, but someone I follow was saying in response to this, like, we, uh, <laughs> uh, I admit that like kidnapping a CEO isn't the easiest thing, but maybe they should have done that. And then they, then they'd replied to themselves and been like, actually, never mind. I found like a news source where like the French, because the French are just like fucking hard motherfuckers yeah. when it comes to protesting had literally kept up the CEO. Um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I saw, um, yeah, yeah, like, there was, there's been quite a few good French protests. Like, it was, like, some um, union sewage workers that weren't, um, like, I think it was, like, the price of gas had gone up too much that they couldn't afford to operate their trucks. So they put their, like, sewage pump tube things in reverse and just, oh, like, fired them into politicians' oh, windows. Yeah. Which is, like... <laughs> I so fucking love epic. that so much. Also, Tim, ever since yeah, you yeah. told me about the... Or you said on, on the show, actually, about, like, um, anti-raid organization, like, uh, people doing, like, counter-raids oh, yeah. on politicians yeah, yeah, who yeah, are yeah. responsible for yeah, the immigration yeah. raids. It was like, the, um... I just can't Polynesian stop Panthers, thinking about man. that. I just, I literally, like, yeah. I... We've had so much egregious shit from the Home Office recently. I don't know whether mm. this was covered on the show, um, because I'm, uh, too hot to be a viewer of the show. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, while I was in... Too cold, too hot. <laughs> <laughs> while I was in Yerevan, we, um, the, the, they announced that the Home Office is, like, starting to conduct an investigation into the pathology of people who died at Hillsborough. Like, the Home Office does so much evil shit all mm. the time, like, trying to fly people like, to Rwanda like, and, like... So they're trying, like, by finding the pathology, you mean, like, they're trying to, like, find the, um, the like the natural causes of death is that what they're looking for or no 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 no. they're trying to prove that the people who died in the hillsborough disaster rather than it being the cops fault were actually evil criminals who did who yeah, had they bad did it criminal oh race. okay yeah. all right yeah yeah, yeah. And i my think you're trying to died. say they all like died my un- of heart attacks at the same time or something right like no 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 my my yeah. uncle died in the hillsborough disaster and uh I did spend a little bit of time walking around the apartment in Armenia, just like shaking, saying unwise things that I cannot repeat on the stream. And, <laughs> and when we, like, we went out for a so walk boring. afterwards, cause we were like so steamed about it. And we were just talking about the, like the counter raids thing and how, like how mm. fucking based it would be if someone hypothetically did like counter raid shit on the home office, like showed up with the megaphones yeah. and like shining the lights in the windows. And, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, right. on- honestly, just like any shit that makes it like, makes people regret working at the home office because like, honestly, yeah, like, yeah. you know, uh, Nat, and it's not my policy. This is, this is Nat speaking and she does not speak for Red Planet. Nat has been saying for a long time that she thinks that like doxing, like ICE agents, anyone, like people responsible mm. for like the, the most integral mechanisms of yeah. like state terrorism on the poor is fine because and that's nat's opinion not mine um mm. and she's just like she's just like people should just fucking regret working at the home office because it is just like the most fascist organ of british government yeah there's nothing good about it it's there's horrible well, i think like, about it. there is like a thing where like people kind of like say that okay cool um you know like your home life or your social life or whatever should be off limits for like you know like um if you right. uh you know, like, confronting, like, a politician or whatever like that. It's like, no, you should protest in this way or whatever. But I think that, like, de- you know, depending on the stakes, depending on what it, the causes of protest and stuff like that, I think that you can, you know, you can draw a line, you know? And it's like, it is that, that kind of civility politics or whatever where it's like, you know, on the news they'll be like, they came to their homes or whatever, where it's like, you know, we get, like, poor people getting their doors kicked in and shot every day yeah. so you know, like, fucking it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. The... i like yeah i'm not too i'm not too <laughs> opposed to the think, idea of um i think since we were anti-raid. having a discussion about anti raids in the first place like the it's like uh if you are oh shit just left her charger here um if you're like 
responsible for the uh for for like vans that show up in the middle of the fucking night to just grab yeah. people out of their homes then the argument feels a lot weaker i'll say that your like yeah, personal yeah. life is off limits compared to your political life because it's like fucking yeah, yeah. Did, did yeah like like you're saying like do poor people do, like immigrants do, like do, do, like the people mm. who get terrorized with they don't have the luxury of like their personal yeah. life being off limits from politics uh yeah, well, we've strayed pretty like, far from we yeah have, yeah i was gonna actually topic. say we could bring it we could bring it back around right I'm, okay yeah. um, hear the master yeah, of so come on there were some there was some come uh yeah i mean there's been like a lot of criticism about just stop oil and yeah. all this kind of stuff and one thing that i saw uh people mentioning was that some of the um the big kind of um sponsors of just stop oil are like you know like the grandchildren of petrochemical magnets or whatever like that and um they began sponsor they began um funding like more you know like donating money to these orgs after like there's like some interviews whatever where they talk about the protesters showing up at their homes and then all of a sudden it got very real and they're like okay we're gonna start you know like donating money and so some people have taken that as like oh you know like this is a way to um for them to de-escalate, you know, they're like, okay, well, if we give them money, you know, they'll stop coming to our homes. Right. Other people are saying, like, other things, like, it's like, um, you know, like, I mean, and I, 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 I kind of, the way I see it is that it's like, okay, so a bunch of people showed up at the obscenely rich people's houses yeah. and scared them so much that they started giving money to, you know, like, to these orgs. Yeah. It's like that to me that shows me that it's like this is a very effective strategy, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> you know? I, like... what I've seen in response to the this specific just up oil protest is like a lot of people uh talking as if they like authoritatively know, like as if they have like a, a complete assessment of like the intelligence mm. apparatus of the state being like this is an yeah. op. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck are you talking like my friend who used to fucking work in the NSA does not like think this is an op like what are you fucking yeah. talking like you're you're literally looking at like two young people one with like dyed hair fucking doing like a bit yeah, of yeah. like slightly flamboyant protesting like what mm. part of this looks like an op like if you find this embarrassing just why can't you believe it's just like embarrassing but yeah real, yeah you know like that's the thing for me i think it's like it's it is it, it's kids doing a thing that is like I guess, like, it's relatively low stakes yeah. for them, you know. It's like kids, they're not going to go to jail or anything like that. Of course, it's not like blowing up a pipeline or whatever. I would, like, you know, like, I, like, yeah, I feel like it's wild. It's like, are you telling me that you as an adult would tell a child to go and blow up an oil pipeline? Like, right. I think, like, you know, that is a yeah. thing that, you know, like, if you are, you know, like, we got like the land defenders and uh, the water protectors and all that kind of stuff like that. That was like a very serious thing that was discussed you know, like, among adults, all this kind of thing like that. It's kind of like, I mean, just let the kids do their wacky soup stuff, <laughs> you know, like, whatever, yeah, like, I mean, I mean, it's like the, the, the painting was protected and stuff, and it's like, I think, you know, like, there is the whole thing where it's like, people say, oh, this is bad publicity for the cause or whatever, but then when we look at, like, you know, that guy set himself on fire a while back, and, like, I can't even remember his name, and I'm, like, clued up on this shit, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's like people probably being a little bit too out the gate on that. But I mean, I, I you know, like it's pretty, I think pretty yeah. early on in Red Planet, we talked about like uh, protest versus sabotage, and like protest right. is about raising awareness. Yeah. And like people talk yeah. so much about like bad optics, but it's literally like it's getting people fucking talking about it. Like yeah. that. So mm -hmm. like uh, for those who aren't aware of the story at all, I haven't seen the, like, the the clip of them doing it. The kids were like. Uh, do you think art is worth more than life? Like, which is worth yeah. more to you, art or life? And their point was that, like, if you're this upset about this painting, why are you not upset that the fucking planet's on fire? And, like, yeah. that's in entirely valid. Like, th their point yeah, yeah. rings entirely true. And, like, everyone's fucking talking about it. So it's like, exactly. yeah, and, you know. Yeah. So there's maybe, like, also a larger thing that a lot of people are unaware of about, um, like, uh, the, you know, like... I mean, well, there's a lot of museums in the UK that do actually have relationships with BP and yeah. do take a lot of money from them. Um, it's so not like for example, a huge the, uh, amount in the 
Example Total. here: pressure on British Museum to ditch BP mounts following UK's summer heat, uh, summer record summer heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, you know, and like this has been an ongoing thing. Like, I mean, it's like in in um, like the totality of all the uni oh, all the museum fundings, it's like not like you know, it's not like they're totally sponsoring them themselves or whatever. But um, as a you know, like um, like out of all of the major sponsors and stuff, um, a lot of people consider, you know, BP to be one of the more problematic ones just because of, yeah. you know, like climate change and stuff like that. Whereas like, I'm sure if you looked through it, you'd find out that there were like other equally terrible I mean, <laughs> companies um, and people. Like A, definitely. B, they're, they're sponsoring the British Museum, which is itself just vile. Mm. Um, but then, but like, I know, yeah. See, I, I, I want to say uh, it's not just climate change. Like BP is yeah. like, deeply awful in it's like where it's like yeah, neocolonialism yeah. for those who aren't aware like bp uh i have shit like bp and shell will have like extraction sites set up in um i think like the congo i'm not entirely sure but in in africa and like there are like constant terrorist attacks against them because of the environmental like devastation yeah. that they are doing and it never makes them like reconsider yeah. like maybe we shouldn't be fucking doing this instead yeah, they, just, yeah, yeah. they just build like compounds with like tons of like armed security guards and like massive walls and shit and like people yeah. mm. from like the imperial corps who work at these kind of extraction extraction sites like literally like fly in by helicopter spend their entire time in the like maximum security compound and then fly back again because like that's how angry everyone in the local area is um yeah 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 I was something I was thinking about a little bit. So this is definitely a tangent now. Um, it was something I was thinking about a little bit when I was in Armenia. Was like looking at so Armenia has a lot of copper and molybdenum, copper and molybdenum mines, and environmental mm. activists there are kind of upset about like the record of like you know environmental devastation to to dig out all the like molybdenum or whatever. But like it's interesting to think about in the context of like a post-Soviet country because obviously those would have been places where like the state was doing that and like the state is the state is the same organ that you can expect to be like both extracting the resources but also like if you wanted someone to do reforestation and like to repair the damage in any way then it would be the same people right whereas like this fucking sickness that global capitalism has us in is just like it's completely fine for bp or shell to be in nigeria in the congo in south america in everywhere right doing doing yeah. devastating mining but it's like those countries who literally have less money than the company, like yeah, who yeah. would have to do some kind of like reforestation or whatever. Um, Mule, you, you shared us a little a little tweet as well in relation to this well, story. What's yeah? What's incredible about uh, this is that even though the protesters were taken into custody, according to the Metropolitan Police of London, um, Just Stop Oil have cracked on. They're they're not stopping, <laughs> and they've upgraded. Yeah, yeah. They've upgraded now. Uh, not just to, to throwing soup from a can, uh, <laughs> but now what they're doing is they're getting a high pressure uh, gun, a high pressure <laughs> fluid gun, yeah. filling mm. that with soup and absolutely plastering a the bit. front facade of the Aston Martin uh, showroom yes. in, in London. And uh, that's really awesome. Actually. It's I incredible. Like the, the the footage is is uh, interesting. It's hard to kind of. There's a guy that's like having a go at the person that's doing it, saying, "Ah, eh, look at you and your stupid tank top and all this," and like going, <laughs> "Eh, you're an idiot." But the the person is like going on, like still going on, saying like, "We will not, you know, yeah. we will not surrender. Yeah, yeah. We will keep doing this, like, blah, blah, despite they can't put us all in prison and all this." And it's really based, so uh, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah, a bit like the uh, a bit like the reversed sewage stuff. It's like the it's like a yeah, pressure yeah, that's washer, what I was thinking. but like full of soup. Actually, I think I'm looking yeah, at the yeah. video now. I think I think it's actually a fire extinguisher full of soup. It, <laughs> whatever it is, I think it might be a fire <laughs> extinguisher full of soup. That's awesome. I, th yeah. I thought it was like a pressure washer that they've like <laughs> yeah, changed maybe. or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah uh, it's great though. Really um, good. Absolutely a handy little device. <laughs> yeah, I think there's um get one for your home. Yeah. There's um, a lot of stuff to be said as well about, um, you know, like, uh, the way that art functions, like, you know, the relationship between art and capital and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And, um, yes. and I think that, like, yeah, like, I mean, there's probably someone out there that's written something very, you know, a lot, uh, a lot better on it than I can just, like, come up off the top of my head. But I was thinking about this a lot, where it's kind of like... You know, like, uh, yeah, these museums and art galleries and stuff like that just do become gigantic, like, um, 
yeah, like big banks of of capital, right? You know, it's yeah. like the um, yeah, there's um, I think it is kind of like I mean, it's like yeah, it's a, it's a great painting, it's an amazing painting, and it has like a lot of history and all this kind of stuff like that. But um, yeah, yeah I do really kind of like empathize with the um, thing where it's like why. Why do we care so much about these paintings when it's like, man, we, we don't have too much time left, you know? There's going to be no paintings yeah. at some point, right? Like, yeah, right. Be... Surely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or there will be, like, just, all the paintings just... in the world will, like, default into, like, the possession of uh, Elon Musk's fifth child when, like, right. mm. every rich person has left every painting in their will to, like, a chain of rich people until, like, yeah. X12 gets them all, and then they go on the compound... And, like, everyone yeah, else yeah. is fucking burned away. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be, like, one of those, you know, like, classic scenes where you see, like, you know, like, um, walking into, like, the parlor of some ex- obscenely rich person and they've just got all these, like, artifacts from all over the world and stuff. <laughs> one day they're in one room, you yeah, know? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're going to live on, like, yeah, like a, a satellite and we're all just going to live in the dirt. For so, clarification, yeah. we are we are, we are are playing at Doomerism here. Uh, we don't think this is actually going to happen. Um, yeah. Uh, Mule, you want to talk about We are going to start looking into how to take down satellites, though. <laughs> <laughs> you just go, Us Tim, you just go Akira. You just go Akira and you jump <laughs> in space and you get, mm. you know, that's what the character Akira does. I would, simply, yeah. I would simply go Super Saiyan. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, I confronted with do. the Tsar's cavalry man. I would simply, uh, I would simply <laughs> first train in a hundred times gravity, and then yes. I would unleash my true potential. Uh, Mule, you want to tell yeah. us about the next news story? Yeah, I will tell you about the next news story because the next news story is about the Canary Media workers forming a cooperative. Um, th- 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 there's not really a reason for me to form it based on that title. I just thought that was a nice segue. Don't question it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the Canary. If you don't know what the Canary is, the Canary is a lefty socialist uh, newspaper yeah. based in the UK, and they've done a lot of. I believe it's called the Canary because it's like the Canary Wharf, or it, or maybe it's a. Is it something to do with the miners' strikes? I can't remember exactly, but anyway, it's, I, it's, yeah, I figured it was like the old like mining thing or whatever, right? You know, but I, I imagine it is. I imagine it is because they're very like. Uh, union, uh, pro union, pro like yeah. pro. Oh my god, am like I going that. on a tangent again? It's a brief one. My girlfriend's uh, family has a canary, and the one time my nan uh, tried to cook a chicken at sixty degrees in the in the oven and left it there for like forty two hours straight because she did not understand the concept of like slow cooking, and uh, they all got carbon carbon monoxide poisoning, and they literally found out it was happening because their canary died. Um, oh, oh my shit. god, Ugh. what the yeah. fuck? Yeah. Well, that sucks. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done, it's done. <laughs> well, unlike <laughs> unlike that canary, this canary is <laughs> flourishing and thriving. True. Uh, the canary media workers, like, like I say, uh, they've formed, formed a cooperative, yep. um, which is great because essentially a worker-owned co-op basically means that the workers own the business. So yeah, everyone yeah. has an equal share in the business mm. everyone is is basically paid the same Very from what cool. i understand um which is so dope uh the bosses are gone um everything is sort of you know voted on what kind of like this this decisions the company makes in order to uh you know to actually uh uh what well whatever kind of decisions they make in order in order it ha- to decide how the business is run i guess i don't know much about this shit as you can tell um yeah, yeah. But it's really, really cool. It's um, It says here in the article, the Canary Workers Co-op has adopted a horizontal and sociocratic structure. This means there will no longer be bosses and the workers will yep. make all the decisions themselves uh-huh. in decentralized working groups and general meetings. Um, yeah, yeah. I kind of think that this is going to operate in the same way that Greater Manchester Tenants Union operates, um, the one that I'm on the committee of, and basically that's how we kind of do it. We have like a, a, a general all-members meeting and, you know, people are sort of elected to the committee that way and then the committee sort of makes um decisions and brings you know stuff to yeah. the uh, to the committee based on what like for example i'm a member solidarity officer so if anyone in the member solidarity group wants me to bring anything to the committee i'll take that to the uh-huh. committee based on the decisions that they've done and then everybody votes for it on the committee so but i think actually that is less democratic than what is going on here right because rather Maybe. than like a committee deciding on it it sounds like 
it sounds like everybody is deciding, like everyone gets yeah, to yeah. vote on what's going on. I've seen like different kind of um, examples of these kind of structures working before, like, you, you know, like in different kinds of um, things, you know, like different kinds of businesses. Um, I, From what I remember of a friend who worked for a, like a newspaper that was kind of like a little co-op thing once, they would have different, you know, different workers' councils, different Soviets, <laughs> say. but it would be like, um, so, you know, uh, like they would have everyone that would work and kind of like design and layout and all this kind of stuff. And then they would vote on things relevant to that, you know, and they would have like people that worked and other things and they would all vote, you know, so it was all like democratic, but it was kind of like split up so that, you know, you wouldn't have people that were like totally uninformed on something yeah. would be like voting on it, which um, I think like kind of makes sense. But um, yeah, but then, I mean, I guess like I've heard of things being totally just everyone votes on everything. Um, so, so I guess you just, I mean, I guess you just vote on how you want to handle it. Yeah, I think a few notes on this. Uh, one, the IWW, our, our good friends at the IWW uh, are involved mm. with this, and have, uh, like our first source here is like publishing from the IWW, like the official yeah. statement from the Workers Co-op. Um, obviously, the IW, the IWW. I'm just gonna say the Wobblies. Fucking hell. Um, obviously, <laughs> the Wobblies are based. And it's always yeah. good to see them involved. Um, they Part of the statement says, While co-ops still exist under capitalism, we recognize the revolutionary spirit of this initiative uh, that sets a positive example for others to follow, embodying the change you want to see, taking control of your own workplace, using your platform for the benefit of the working class. Uh, and it ends with, Dump the bosses off your back, which I really appreciate. Especially, this is the thing I'm always saying, right, is like the relationships that we have under capitalism that seem to be one-sided, when you actually work together, it can go the exact other way. You can arrest the police, you can evict your landlord, you can fire your boss. And that's, I mean, that's, they've, they've literally just done it. Um, company directors were being paid loads more um, and uh, by, like, by exploiting uh, tax loopholes, like being paid tons more than everyone yeah. else. And yeah, yeah. There was a, uh, it's been said there's a, there was a culture of manipulation and toxicity and mm. like, yeah, um, I've had, I think, yeah, it says here as well, like, uh, directors had, uh, unlimited paid leave while workers had limited yeah, yeah. annual leave and sick allowances. So it's like, so yeah, that was it seems that, like, yeah, they, they had talked about like having a really hard time getting time off, you know, like even just, um, you know, like taking enough, getting enough sick days yeah. or whatever like that. And then they, you know, they were coming to work and seeing their boss. You know, their bosses were just able to take unlimited sick time without even giving any notice or anything. Yeah. And being so, if um, if you took time off as a canary worker, you only got paid like sixty percent of your wage or whatever. You know, on your holiday pay, whereas the bosses would just get their full amount and they could just go and do whatever any time. Yeah. So, um, I can see that very easily. You know, like building up a little bit of um resentment from the workers. Because yeah, absolutely. It fucking sucks. It's yeah. definitely it's definitely become more democratic. It also seems like it's just becoming a better a better a better place to work and also just yeah. like it's it's cool yeah i mean as the as they're saying in the statement there like the like using your platform as a media outlet and also being a workers co-op is really fucking cool because if people are getting their yeah. news from a workers co-op that i don't know it's it's i feel like it's more likely to be uh yeah. have a good perspective on it and obviously when we yes. get when you know when us uh, red planet hosts unite and fire conrad uh, and become a workers co-op <laughs> then, then we will uh then we'll be free and we'll be able to say all of the things we've been holding back um <laughs> that's not true so, um yeah <laughs> so just just like quickly before we get just quickly before we get into the next news story i'm yeah. gonna jump into the waiting room with matt and john and make sure that their audio oh, and video sure is thing. all good oh, yeah, sure cool. i'm all just right, gonna cool. read out this all tweet right. from the uh canary in the meantime and say, uh, finally, we, we're grateful to us. Oh, hang on. This is actually a thread, so I'm just going to have a little skim through it. Um, it's basically, it's just des describing what they've been up to. Uh, staff received either 65% of pay or statutory sick pay. Statutory sick pay went ill. Uh, while directors received 100% sick pay and could take unlimited sick leave. That's fucked. Um, directors could take large chunks of time off without notice or cover. Meanwhile, editors, writers had limited holiday allowance. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a little more detail on yeah. what we were describing before, basically. And uh, if you want the if you want the full thing, you can go to at the Canary UK, and there's the full thread. Uh, and they yeah. said lastly, 
We're grateful to our supporters and readers for being our lifeline in the fight against the establishment. Along with following us on social media, you can sign up for our daily updates via email and a weekly roundup from our staff. So I advise people to do that. That's pretty cool. Um, Tim, do you want to tell us about the next story? Yeah, cool. So this is another one just from the other week, which is um, about Philadelphia Art Museum workers going on strike. Uh Um, And so this is another thing relating to, you know, like museums and art galleries and stuff like that. Uh, These, so these workers here, they are entrusted with kind of working in these institute, these prestigious institutions, harboring, you know, huge, huge, um, chunks of capital <laughs> you yeah, know you know like uh you know like uh the paintings the displays everything like that it's um you know there's like a tremendous amount of wealth there but then these these workers that are working there are like getting aren't really getting paid much at all right um you know uh like they they're not even able to like pay off their student loans or anything like that but there's you know like these jobs that require huge student loans to even kind of get into and stuff exactly. um and so, you know, like, and they were like seeing their bosses getting bonuses and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then a couple of years back, there was um, a group got together and put together this thing called the Art and Museum Transparency Organization. And uh, basically, they created a spreadsheet that you could anonymously submit your like salary details everything to like mm-hmm. you know totally anonymously but you'd say this is where i'm at i'm working at this institution this is what i do and this is how much i get paid oh damn so then all of a sudden people were able to see they were able to look at it and be like oh damn i work at this place and i'm not getting paid that or yep. other people will be able to say like oh and why am i getting paid you know more or whatever you know because there's like so many reasons why this could happen and um and yeah employers generally don't like you talking about these things in some places it's even illegal so um yeah doing it anonymously meant that they were all able to talk about it and they were able to see the ways in which they were kind of you know being like exploited i guess um and so that spread people started submitting to it from all over the place and um yeah so after that it started inspiring like a wave of kind of like strikes and things all these like you know, museum workers being like, hey, why are we all just getting paid, like, minimum wage or whatever when, you know, like, we had to study for years and years to get here. Like, the, you know, museum execs are getting huge bonuses. These, like, you know, like, a single piece of art is worth more than, you know, like, our entire salaries combined. All these kind of things. So, um, yeah, so yeah. they've been striking for a little while on and off different museums, um and art galleries and stuff um i just think this is like a really good example of just people just getting together and just um yeah you know like uh sharing that information and stuff and it's like yeah yeah it's like the kind of thing it's like anytime your boss tells you that you shouldn't be doing t- talking about something doing something whether it's like talking about unions or anything yeah. like that it's probably a pretty good sign that you should start talking about it you know yeah, I, re- yeah. I remember um, really clearly working in an office job and like someone being hired on the same essentially the the same role title as me and everything and he was doing like not very much like they because of the like like the experience that i had already they they were just assigning me to like loads loads more programming tasks and loads more like high level technical stuff and i wanted to chat to him about wages not because i wanted to be paid more than him but just because like I i wanted to see what the vibe was and like he was he he just did that like you know that thing and he was like i I, I don't know. I I I I don't think it's. I don't really feel comfortable discussing. I was like, you fucking knock. What are you doing? Come on, <laughs> yeah. come on, man. Um, I wanted to say two things about this story in particular. One is like the fact that it's an online resource that's sharing that information is exactly what I'm always saying about the internet as like huge revolutionary potential. Like the the mass availability of information and for people to just like link up with like other people they don't know or they do know but they can't like necessarily talk face to face and just like yeah. share that information like you're saying it was like an, an anonymous spreadsheet um mm. it just yeah it, it does stuff like this it creates stuff like this the other thing i wanted to say is uh gritty as a symbol of philadelphia <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's just always great to see like gritty has moved from like anti-fascist to now just being just like just being leftist in general and like it's cool to see <laughs> this gritty sign at the union protest um yeah 
it's a bit like the uh, this the communication workers union in Britain, uh, the po- like the the postal strike that's been going on. Uh, they've started to have uh, a mascot dressed up as Postman Pat show up at um at uh, yeah, right. enough is enough rallies, which I just think is yeah. fantastic. For those who aren't familiar, Postman Pat is like a, an English. Um, was it a cartoon or like a claymation thing? It's a stop motion. Stop motion, yeah, yeah. right? St- similar style to Wallace and Gromit. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, who was just about about a cute little postman just doing the rounds, and so it's just, just a like, weird little guy. Yeah, just a weird little guy uh, with a cat. There was a yeah, uh, yeah there was a, a cool thing for a while. It didn't really hold on. It didn't really stick. But um, in New Zealand, late uh, late at night, they used to turn the TV off basically mm-hmm. like you know this is when i was growing up it was like, i can't remember what time it was but then they would just play this little cartoon right. called good night kiwi and it was this little kiwi mm-hmm. and he would climb up the little tv antenna thing well like you know the satellite thing Aww. and then he'd make his little bed inside the dish and go to sleep Aww. and he's this little kiwi wearing a little denim vest a little and um kiwi. then during like when uh, there was lots of controversy over here with like stefan molyneux and right. lauren southern coming and stuff um if someone made started making these like good night kiwi like good night alt right um oh, good night kiwis <laughs> nice because <laughs> um, he has a little denim vest on and so he had like a little patch on the back and stuff it was okay. really good and like yeah like it was going around a little bit it was kind of like the you know like our i'm very into that pretty i'm watching but, um, it now it's pretty cute yeah I love uh, yeah, yeah 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 but that disappeared so uh, i i would i'd love to see a resurgence of um of the uh the leftist icon good night yeah. kiwi <laughs> Tim, speaking of all. speaking of your ends, uh, do you want to tell us yeah. about the next story, which is also in Aotearoa? Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, I was just hanging out with some of these people uh, the night before last. So um, yeah, so down here there has been a lot of uh, strikes with university staff because they're just not getting paid much. Their contracts suck. Oh, you know, all the normal kind of stuff. Yeah, just what um, you expect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a, a lot of strikes that we've been seeing lately have just been, even just to keep up with inflation and stuff. Um, and so, you know, and uh, a lot of the universities up here have been, well, in particular, um, Auckland University, uh, University of Auckland has been pretty shit, like suspending um, the staff that were, you know, striking and things like that. Um, whereas, you know, the other universities were like, no, we're not going to suspend the pay of staff that are going to be striking. And so, but there's been like, there's been so much stuff with Auckland University. Um, it was like a little kind of like, yeah, speaking of alt-right, it was a little alt-right hotbed for a little while. And oh, like shit. the staff were like not really addressing it and kind of pretending it wasn't a thing. And then you get like some of this, like some of the staff there actually buying into it and like kind of even getting on like the wild kind of like anti-vax bandwagons and all this kind of shit. Um, and so, yeah, so there's a lot of people, particularly um, Maori staff, that find it as, like, quite a hostile environment. Um, right. So, um, yeah, so it hasn't been great. Uh, but kind of just going to have to gloss over this because we're, you know, it's taking the time. But, um, yeah, so during COVID and stuff, the university really relied on all these, all these tutors, staff, technical staff as well, to be keeping things going and, like, to... Like, I mean, they're the only reason the university was still functioning, you know, is because uh, all the tutors and everything were continuing to do these kind of like remote lectures, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, they're not getting, they they weren't getting any pay rises. The university heads were getting sick bonuses. There was like, um, I think they like, they hired a new chancellor i think it was and they bought like a multi-million dollar property for her to live in or so oh. it was like something wild like that Incredible. i think she ended up like it was such like a bad pr move i think she was actually like no this isn't like appropriate or whatever but um <laughs> yeah but even then like you know it like, is a bad look she still gets paid like a pretty huge salary yeah uh compared to you know like the average tutors and stuff so mm-hmm. yeah and I mean, this is like a university that made like I think it was like something like I can't remember how much they made. Hundred million. After tax. Is that? Is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, after tax profit, a hundred million last year. You know, and there's like there's staff that can't even you know like afford to pay market rent. In Jesus Christ, Portland, which is pretty well. So um, That's so yeah, fucked. so that really sucks. But yeah. um, we should be, I think, yeah. Kinda, uh, moving Mule, along. Well, we only have one more have... news piece. So, Mule, do you want to tell us about the the protests in Iran? Gladly, I will tell you about that. 
So this is the fourth week of uh, protests in Iran. And uh, I've heard a couple of people say that the Colin protest is a little, um, I don't know, uh, it's, it's a little dismissive of the revolutionary nature right. um, of what's going on. We literally have people who are um, basically saying, we do not care if we are killed, we need yeah. change now. And I think that sort of elevates it beyond the protest, but that's just my two pence, you know? Yeah. Um, I will say, I've anyway. just been in the region. I mean, we might be doing a discussion in a few weeks about kind of my yes. travels in the region, but, like, uh, I would I would kind of agree very strongly with that, that, like, shit mm. is really kicking off, and, like, if you talk to anyone kind of there, uh, they're like, yeah, um, the Iranian government is... Uh, cooked <laughs> like it's yeah, yeah it's yeah. some shit's going on it's over uh-huh yeah. so yeah with that in mind though let's talk about what's actually been going on um so we've had schoolgirls chanting slogans in the street um and in school i think workers going on strike street clashes uh on saturday i think this would be last saturday maybe it might yeah. have been yesterday or the, the one before no no it was one before this is the one before oh. um as protests over the death of Masa Amini entered the fourth week. Mm. Um, which is, you know, just amazing because it's like, it's just so, I don't know, we spoke about it on the last Red Planet and there's so much to talk about in terms of like, you know, because, and I think we have to really, really be solid. Like we said last time uh, on the stream, we have to be really solid as leftists and not sort of let this, you know, um, take us back into reactionary opinions on islam for example because right. it's not this isn't an, a, a muslim thing this is literally a dictatorship thing that's what this is it's it's a theocracy um and you know in theocracies they aren't necessarily using um the correct like, like the the most widely um accepted version of the religion uh in yeah. in, in their theocracy so we have to remember that absolutely um this is a dictatorship it, it's it's uh, basically a, an oppression one of the, the the biggest oppressions of women that we've seen in in uh, i don't know in in recent history really mm. um so we've got um girls were heard chanting sorry this was at a school in amini's hometown mm -hmm. uh Sakez in a kurdistan prov province they were chanting woman life and freedom um which is incredible for that to be happening in a school in Iran. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, there was another group of girls seen swinging headscarves above their heads on a street. Uh, in in videos, the Hengar rights group said were recorded on Saturday. Mm. So I think Saturday was a big day of protest, uh, a big day of, uh, of action, really, rather than protest in, uh, in Iran. Yeah. Uh, we've also got... Uh, uh, people flying a huge banner that was placed on an overpass of the Madares Highway that cuts through central Tehran saying, we are not afraid anymore, we will fight. Incredible. Again, sort of echoing back to what I said before, that this is now not just people going out and holding signs, this is people literally saying, um, we know that you're killing us, we know that you're going to shoot us, we don't care, yeah. basically. Uh, which is incredibly brave, incredibly courageous, like the mm. likes, of, like courage, the likes of which, you know, I don't think we've seen in the Imperial Corps for a long time. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly not in Britain. I think um, maybe in, in France. Yeah, maybe, maybe, in, <laughs> maybe, maybe the French fireman who lit himself on fire to yeah, fight the cops. On fire. Who, like, yeah, the only yeah, time yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. like powerfully attracted to a man in uniform. Um, <laughs> the uh, I, you might have already discussed this in the in the discussion before last week, or but like. There was a video of, like, an old woman taking off her headscarf as well. I, I, just, I just thought that was really powerful. Like, if you imagine being a woman in Iran and, like, maybe, like, if, if you imagine, like, being her daughter, her niece, like, someone who knows her, and just, like, knowing that this woman has, like, worn a headscarf for decades, and then she's yeah. like, nah, fuck this. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, like, she's she's only been doing it because she's been made to. Like, you know, I get, like Mule said, like, not to lead us into any kind of reactionary opinions about it. Like, lots of people uh, choose to and like to wear the headscarf. Yeah, yeah. Like, but, like, someone who's been made to is like, no, fuck this. And, like, I don't know. I, it was just the symbology of, like, an old woman doing it. Just, like, right. had me a little teary, honestly. It was really beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it fucks, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And uh, more info about this... Uh... In, a, in another widely shared video, a man has been seen altering the wording 
of a large government billboard from the police are the servants of the people to the police are the murderers of the people. Ooh. And related to that, Oslo-based human Iran, sorry, Shit. Oslo-based group Iran Human Rights says at least 92 protesters have been killed by the security forces, and that's wow, yeah, what we wild, know man. about. Fuck. So just sort of like tying this up in a nice, neat um, bow because we want to, you know, uh, get our guests on as soon as possible. Um, this we can relate to this sort of in the Imperial Corps from a sort of, I guess. Uh, I don't what would you call it, vicarious way? We can relate to it on a very surface level way, I guess is the right way to say this. Mm. In the ultra-conservative president, Ibrahim Raisi, um, basically has been blaming the unrest on outside forces. I think yeah. this is something we've spoken about. Uh -huh. uh, I think you mentioned yeah, that yeah. last time, Tim. And that is just what our leaders do when unrest is happening. Actually, and parents and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's Antifa. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's someone outside. It's Venezuela. Um, yeah. You know, it's the it's the the death ray of Cuba that gives you Havana <laughs> syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff. It's it's always, 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 never, never, never the government's fault. It, you know, the reason mm. that people are doing this. And I guess what you could say is, when they do it in our country, when you see people in well, in our country, in our countries, in the imperial court, yeah. what we generally tend to see is people saying things like, oh, it's it's the woke brigade, or like, right, oh, it's, right. uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's the queers, or oh, it's the Antifa, and that kind of yeah, yeah. sounds like an outside force from within, basically. So yeah, it's yeah, infiltration, yeah. and that's what, that's what Ibrahim like, Rahisi's trying to Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah, with the, um, like, with the, um, everything around, like, you know, like, kind of um, Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd protests and stuff like that, where they were saying, like, this, as opposed to, like, a justified, um, you know, an, a justified kind of response to hundreds of years of, you know, like African American oppression or whatever. People are like, no, it's like these Antifa people are getting in yeah. there and they're stirring up, they're stirring people up and stuff. And it's like kind of like, it's, um, you know, it's kind of erasing the history, erasing the actual like real material causes of, um, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's, um, it's, it, I mean, it's just such a classic thing. It's like, you know, you can imagine your fucking granddad or whatever like that listening on the radio and being like, oh, yeah, you know, like I hear that there's these, you know, like these outsiders from some other, you know, like the, um, the Iraqi um, Kurd Kurdistan people are hanging out and they're like throwing rocks over the border and they're stirring up the locals or whatever. You well, know? I mean, so, I haven't, you know, I haven't checked in on my, my, my Stalinist pals at the uh, Center for Political Innovation in a while, but like, I think there is like a little, um, I think there is a trend in some, in some people who are like, who love to think of the, uh, who love to think of anything that claims to be Bathism, right? as necessarily or anything that claims even the slightest legacy to to bathism to be like a fully fledged socialist project you know and i think <laughs> yeah. like that's like that's a bit of like yeah like mule was saying like the 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 infiltration narrative like we're 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 abandoning the real the real stuff here and it's letting it all be about and it's like no fucking people can be mad about their real oppression like yeah yeah, yeah. anyway yeah absolutely so that's the news. Uh, well done, everybody. We got through that very quick. We did it. Um, yay! Mm. Now listen, I don't have an intro oh. uh, ri written. See, for this, this is what happens when I take time off. No, all no, the, no. All the showmanship disappears. No, no, no. I thought of one today, Sophie. I thought of <laughs> oh. one just before. In your brain. And, uh, in my but not, fucking brain. But not written down anywhere. No, because fuck that. Okay, uh, because so I'm I can true anarchist. <laughs> so I can see what's happened here. And what true anarchists do is they just don't do anything, uh, write it down or, or any supply chain. Okay, just yeah. forget them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. Well, uh, well, Google Docs so is here's... a hierarchy. So <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, it is a hierarchy. Um, and if you use it, you're a racist. So basically, um, here's my intro. I've never read Foucault, but I know he talks about prisons a lot. And oh my God, don't they suck? He's in prison, yeah. That's right. Prison Everything's is just prison. like a prison. Yeah, everything's a prison, and you know what? Real ones that actually exist are nothing to be laughed at. So if you're laughing now at this intro, it's you're true. bad. It's true. Uh, you're a terrible person. Cancelled. So anyway, with <laughs> with that in mind, we have two amazing guests yeah. coming on. Uh, John and Matt from the Prisoner Solidarity okay. Network, based in London, I believe. Uh, based in Emphasis general? on the word based, yeah. And 
they are going to be talking to us about what Prisoner Solidarity Network do uh, and what kind of actions that they've been involved with over the last year and maybe even longer. So I'm going to drag them in now. Sounds sick. Uh, let me just see. Apologies. In, yep, now the entire in stream advance. has broken. So I will now yep. <laughs> start rearranging things and we'll, so, it will be a little while until it's sorted. John and Matt, welcome in. You're live oh. on uh, on stream now. Hope you're doing all right. Uh, yeah, there's your video. Perfect. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so we've just given you a little intro, a little rubbish intro. Don't know if you heard, you heard that. Um, but why don't you actually tell us about what Prisoner Solidarity Network is all about? Yeah, Matt. Mate, all right, okay. Well, do you know what I, I can do? I'm going to read straight from our website, um, oh which, God, which, which uh, lists um, uh, what we're about. So. Um, oh, hang on. What should we go? Let, let me get this one up here. This is the one. Okay. The Prisoner Solidarity Network is a group of people committed to dismantling the criminal justice system and building a society based on collective care. Our members include, include people inside and outside of prison. Some of us are ex-prisoners. Some of us are children, partners, or friends of people inside. Many of us are survivors of interpersonal and state violence. Some of some of us come to this work through our values rather than direct experience of the prison system. We want to build a society where conflicts can be resolved without resorting to imprisonment and punishment, uh, where our relationships with each other are not shaped by capitalism and where we are not divided by race, class or gender. I hope that was useful. Yeah, that rocks. Honestly, uh, we're just, I'm just getting a little report in the chat. Sophie, have you up the audio for him a little bit? Sophie? Oh, Sophie, you're muted. I don't know if you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, the... so, yeah, I think that that is um, incredibly based. I think that everybody in the chat and I think all the hosts can agree that that's uh, a great cause. Um, why don't you tell us, either of you, whichever, you, you, either of you can, uh, we've, we don't really have two guests on uh, that much, do we? <laughs> So either of you, whoever, if you both want to answer it, if you want to answer it in, you know, sequence, whatever you want to do, um, it's up to you. But what my question is to both of you is, how did you get involved or how did you start uh, the Prisoner Solidarity Network? How did, how did you get involved? How did it start? Um, <clears throat> well, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm an ex-prisoner and um, spent quite a long time in prison actually serving a life sentence. Um, and very early on in my sentence, I became quite active, politically active, in fighting for prisoners' rights and forming, you know, solidarity groups within the prison system itself to try and shift the balance of power to the advantage of prisoners. And towards the end of my time in prison, I made contact with Matt here uh, and he introduced me to PSN and showed me incredible support whilst I was in prison. And uh, now that I'm out, I'm part of the group and want to continue the struggle from this side of the wall. Uh, yeah. That's wicked. And what about you, Matt? Yeah, so I, I got involved. Um, I became aware of a podcast on uh, Navarra Media um, and they have a prisoner or had, uh, it's kind of relatively inactive at the moment, but the episodes are still on there and I highly recommend anyone checking them out called The Lockdown Podcast on Navarra Media, and that's hosted by two of my good friends, Una Ryder and Sam Swan. And um, I was really enjoying their podcast, and I messaged them to tell them that I was enjoying it, and they were saying, look, we're, we're thinking about starting a group. And um, the group initially was uh, going to be called IWOC London, and IWOC is a, was an American organization. Uh, IWOC stands for Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Nice. And uh, the idea was um, that... Yeah, they were going to start a, a London branch of that or a UK branch of, of that. But as we started to organise, we kind of realised that for various reasons, the term IWOC re didn't really speak to the kind of work we were finding ourselves doing. Also, the framing of uh, incarcerated people as workers didn't really apply to all of the UK prison population, as not all of them have jobs and we, we're there to support all the prisoners. Um, and so, um, 
yeah, so we decided to kind of have a bit of a rebrand and in the process have a, a think about, you know, what's our role as a kind of specifically UK focused abolitionist organization. And out of that, the Prisoner Solidarity Network was born. Wicked. That rocks. And I, I want to touch on what you mentioned there, John, um, when you were inside. Did, did you say that you started to speak to Matt when you were inside? Yeah, just towards the end of my time in prison, yeah. Right. Now, that that says to me that that's the kind of work that you do at Prisoner Solidarity Network. A lot of it involves like getting in touch with prisoners on the inside, helping Ooh. them organise, like you said at the start. And I just want to, from obviously from yourself's point of view, John, like how important was that contact with Matt towards the end of your sentence? Oh, absolutely critical and crucial. I mean, the thing about, um, you know, being within the prison system anyway, which is structurally designed to totally isolate prisoners, it's very, very difficult to retain the strength and the motivation to keep organising in a penal environment because of the extreme isolation that you're subject to. Um, particularly when you're isolated in solitary confinement, for example. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the purpose is to totally isolate you and break you. And the thing that kept me going and so uplifted me was the support of friends and comrades on the outside who shared my politics and reassured me that the struggle that we were engaging in in prison was part of a much wider struggle beyond the prison walls. Okay, we weren't isolated, despite the fact that we were in closed institutions. The struggle that we were fighting for our human rights was part of a much wider struggle throughout society and the whole of the world. And that contact with activists on the outside, like Matt, gave me incredible strength and motivation and reassurance, if you like. Because I say the worst thing about prison, no matter how strong you are, is a sense and feeling of total isolation. And that is what unfortunately breaks most prisoners. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. well, it's classified as torture, isn't it? Uh, solitary, yeah. solitary confinement. I'd go yeah. so far as to saying that prisons in general are torture, but that's just me. Um, however, um, I think that that's a really good insight that we can have, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, how PSN helps people on the inside. And what other kind of work is PSN doing at the minute? Well, so we have a, a buddy system uh, where of outside members are matched with inside members. And, and that serves a few functions, I guess. One is that, um, you know, people on the outside can do, I guess, a form of casework on behalf of people. Um, so people on the outside can do casework on behalf of people on the inside um, if they need help as individuals. But when we're doing, I think, our best work is when people themselves on the inside are organizing and and we are on the outside supporting and drawing attention to their struggle. Um, and that's what PSN is about. It's not a charity. Um, we're trying to build a network of mutual support inside and outside of prison. Um, and so, yeah, and so sometimes, you know, well, for for us on the outside, you know, we might hear that, you know, conditions are getting particularly bad at, you know, a certain prison. And then, you know, we're trying to build the kind of network that means we can contact three, four, five people in that prison and, and kind of get a bit more intel on that and start to build a better picture about what's going on in the, the prison, British prison estate at large. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, and many of our inside members are... Mm extremely active i mean they're the, they're the real activists and and we're here very much in a supportive role um so yeah that, that kind of buddy system we've done things where we've yeah just drawn attention to 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 kind of poor conditions especially during covid um where basically everyone was put on a form of solitary confinement um, but almost worse because at least in solitary confinement, you get your own cell. <laughs> right. um, I mean, some of these people were three to a cell, you know, with open sewage locked there, you know, 23 hours a day, sometimes more. And, um, and, and I don't know if you remember that summer and this, this second summer, um, were particularly hot summers. So, you know, there was yep. 
pretty um, pretty crazy temperatures recorded inside cells at that time. So we drew a bit of attention to that. We got some kind of radio interest about some conditions at HMP Coldinley. And, you know, as John says, try and swing that balance of power. And basically the media interest got the kind of governor of the prison to kind of shit themselves and try and, uh, and improve things a bit. Um, but yeah, all kinds of stuff, we, you know, Sometimes we'll organise protests on behalf of prisoners uh, inside. Um, and again, you know, that says the function of raising awareness of, of, you know, their particular case or broader cases of people, say, in solitary confinement. Um, but it also, you know, just showing solidarity that the thing that John mentioned, you know, imprisonment, you know, is can be such an isolating experience for so many people. I've, I've not seen been inside prison, but it's what I've been told. And... And yeah, and um, and yeah. So if we can just show a bit of solidarity and show them that yeah, that they're, they're not alone, then that's also part of what we're doing, giving them strength to fight on the inside. That rocks, and I think that that speaks to um, you know something like like John was saying. It's 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 a wider sort of movement that user being part of here because I think like one of the things that we've spoken about over the last year is the uh, police crimes and sentencing bill. And I think oh. now that more than ever, some, you know, an organization like the Prisoner Solidarity Network is uh, key to the, the activist movement, uh, not just to all prisoners, but to anyone who's scared of getting put in prison. Um, oh. Because of course, now you can just get put in prison for doing things that before would have just been, you know, a fine or something like that, or p perhaps, oh. Uh, you know, you could have just gotten away with it kind of thing with a slap on the wrist. Uh, now people are getting put in prison. Like, for example, we were just talking about these Just Stop Oil kids who literally just threw some soup on a painting of a dead bloke. Mm. And now they've been, you know, taken into custody by specialists. You know, mm. so who knows what's going to happen to them. And I think that I think that sort of having that solidarity there um, is not just great for that but obviously everyone who's already in the incarceral system in, in the UK. So, um, in terms of, um, you know, like what yous are doing with the buddy system, I think that that's really important. We, uh, the Renters' Union in, in Manchester, and I think that London Renters' Union do it like this as well. Uh, we have a similar model where we basically show people, right, you know, so someone comes to us with like a case with a landlord, like, I don't know, say it's a deposit or they're getting evicted or something. And we say, right, here's what you do. Here's how you can sort it out. And we will give you support. If you need help, if you need ideas, you come to us. Is that a sort of similar vibe to what you do with the uh, organizing with Prisoner Solidarity Network? It is. Yeah, it is to a degree. You know, we offer advice, support, whatever. What we're also seeking to do is create a network of resistance within the prison system itself. Mm. So... You know, we've got an increasing number of prisoners who are in contact with us now. Mm. Uh, and obviously, I think our prime function and objective is to help create and support this network of resistance within the prison system itself. Mm. It's very difficult at the moment because prisons are on basic lockdown. And right. the Prison Officers Association have declared that they're not going to lift the lockdown ever because wow. it's giving them the opportunity to retake control of the prisons. So most prisoners are basically in solitary confinement now. So it's and very what... difficult for those prisoners to organise a network of resistance and solidarity because they're kept so, you know, isolated within individual cells. But nevertheless, we do have contact with a lot of prisoners who share and support our beliefs, our ideological beliefs in terms of abolition. Mm. Um, and that gives those prisoners, prisoners an incredible degree of strength and resolve to know that we're supporting them. And there is a network of potential resistance within the prison system itself. So That's amazing. Is Go that on, sorry, a rollover? Sophie. Is that a like a, a rolled over policy from the pandemic that it's, it's still under lockdown or it? Uh, yeah. Right, what, right. What, what the, yeah, what the prison officers are saying is that, I mean, initially the jails were locked down because of the pandemic. Mm. But then what the Prison Officers Association said or claimed is because prisons are now completely out of control, 
and they don't have sufficient staffs to properly police and manage these wings, they're going to keep them locked down permanently. That's so evil. these prisoners are allowed locked down 23 hours a day. Jesus okay? Christ. And a lot of, there's, there's a high degree of mental illness now amongst prisoners in yeah, jail. Yeah, of course. You can imagine now that condition is being worsened by the lockdown. Yeah. And in places like Berwyn, for example, mm. if yeah. mentally ill prisoners are too noisy and keep banging on their door and screaming too loudly, the guards open the door, basically use this spray stuff on them. Jesus. To render them where they can't basically breathe, beat them up, and then lock them up again and walk away laughing. Are we talking like mace, mace spray, yeah. mace pepper spray? Right. Okay. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the the prison officers association, that's a oh. union. I'm just reading here. It's like a a, a screws union, but basically. It's allegedly a union. I mean, they don't call this <laughs> right. a union. They, they, yeah. they call this you know an, an association. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're an extreme right wing group and organization. Uh, when I first came to prison uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, the Prison Officers Association had total control of the prisons. Absolute right. control. Right. And in some prisons, like, for example, Worm and Scrubs, they were systematically murdering prisoners in the segregation unit Jeez. and getting away with it. And when at one occasion the police turned up at the scrubs to investigate the killings and the staff wouldn't let them in. So the mm. rule of law stopped dead at the prison gate. Then there was a public inquiry into the uh, brutality of one of the scrubs. Five prison officers were alleged that were subsequently in prison, not for murder, but for assault. Um, and basically what the judge conducting the public inquiry concluded was uh, the prison officers associate a total control of the prison to the extent where they would determine whether people like doctors or social workers were allowed to engage or visit the prison. Jesus. Um, and that they want to regain control again of the prison system, the prison officers association. Right. And it's them keeping the lockdown going. Yeah. So and the that, reason and I, that I, I brought that up, sorry, Matt, go on. No, I, I was just going to mention, yeah, and it, John, you mentioned that weren't they directly recruiting from the National Front at that time as well? Well, well, yeah, back in, back in the 70s, 70% of prison staff in places like Strangeways were members of the National Front. Okay? Wow, who's surprised there, yeah. chat? Hey, who's and, you know, surprised about openly, that? They would openly walk around with National Front badges on their uniform. Fuck I want me. to just very briefly uh, take a take a moment to say that Purin Puyo has raided us with a party of 104. Thank you so much, Purin. Hello to all of the raiders. We are currently in the middle of an episode of Red Planet, uh, a weekly Kwame roundtable where we chat with people who are doing really based stuff around the world. And at the moment, we have John and Matt from the Prisoner Solidarity Network in UK um, who... Well, they're telling us. Um, at the moment, we're hearing about some of the absolutely dire conditions in UK prisons and also about how a far-right group is, like, you used to have an absolute stranglehold on, on control of the prisons and are trying to regain it. Um, so yeah. please stick around and have a listen because what they have to say is extremely worth hearing. Yes, and support the Prisoner Solidarity Network. Yeah. They're on Twitter, they're on YouTube, they're on... Uh, you're on all sorts, aren't you? You're on Instagram and everything. Um, so please, please, please go and show them some support. If we could get some links in the chat from uh, some mods, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so the the reason that I bring up the prison uh, prison officer association mm. is because just on a quick Google there, it looks like they are trying to do some kind of public uh, PR. They're trying to do some kind of PR stuff by supporting the the current. Uh, vibe of, of, of protests that are going on, uh, union-based protests in the UK. They're supporting the CWU. Um, they're at least doing that on Twitter. So just be mindful, everyone, if you're going to picket lines and you see the POA, you do not march with them and you tell those organizers who they are and who they yeah. used to recruit and who they still recruit from. Because obviously the National Front isn't about now. Um, but it'll be whatever iteration the what 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 is it called the oak something in uh, in the UK they're like called oak hearts or something the the fash and also the EDL um, yeah there's a bunch there's a bunch of fascist organisations in the UK at the minute that I imagine they'll probably be recruiting from so just something to be aware of um, 
Yeah, so that's absolutely horrific. Um, yeah. Just recruiting from the National Front. And so, like, I don't know if this is something you want to talk about, um, but when I met you, John, you were buzzing that you'd met a mank because of your time in Strange Ways. <laughs> and you mentioned something to me about Strange Ways. Is that something that you want to talk about? Something you can talk about? Um, well, yeah, I, I was in Strange Ways just before the riot there. Mm. And, yeah, it was an actually awful place. I, <clears throat> I was in the segregation unit there, or the punishment unit. Um, and it was an absolutely dehumanising, brutal place. And I was unfortunate enough to spend to spend a Christmas there. And the staff, the screws, uh, starved all the prisoners in the seg unit for the whole of Christmas Day. Wouldn't have Jeez. given any food. And they were absolutely brutal. And it was another prison, like the scrubs, where prisoners were being savagely brutalised and in some cases murdered in the segregation unit. And in fact, the riot in 1990, when it kicked off, the long prison yeah. riot in strange ways, that was actually instigated by prisoners from the segregation unit who were only allowed out of their cells to go to the chapel or the church, the prison church on a Sunday. So half a dozen of them went. And during the service, they kicked off. And the other prisoners joined them, and eventually they took the whole prison over. But they initially were trying to highlight and expose the absolute dehumanisation and the brutality inflicted on prisoners in the segregation unit there. So, yeah, it wasn't a good jail, Manchester. Not no. at all. No, and it, it's not really improved. I remember um, there was a show about Strange Ways that was getting oh. about, I think it was on ITV or something. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was just propaganda. It was just screw oh. propaganda, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it was just horrific sort of painting the prisoners as like... I, oh. I do remember specifically this one prisoner that they were they were trying to basically say... There's no saving this guy. All he does, basically, mm. what he would do is he would shit mm. himself all over yeah. his, you know, his cell and stuff yeah. like that. And they would say, like, yeah. oh, he, he's unsavable. He's unsavable. He's completely. But, you know, this is the thing. It's like, what are you doing to sort of, you know, help that person? Like, you know what I mean? You're saying he's unsavable, but where's his mm. support? Where's his mental health support? Mm. Where's his psychiatric support? Uh, you know, yeah. uh, appointments Absolutely. and stuff like that. You know, it's it, it's just Absolutely. like, oh, look at him. He won't stop doing this. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think yeah. that Strange Ways has got any better. And I doubt that many of the no. prisons in the UK have got any better. Either. No, in fact, they're, they're, they're getting... I mean, for a brief time in the prison system during, I suppose, the late 80s and part of the 90s, because of the solidarity, particularly after Strange Ways as well, because of the solidarity amongst prisoners... There was, a, there was a slight shift in the balance of power, okay, particularly in the maximum security prisons, the long-term prisons. Mm. And there was almost, we almost achieved a sort of liberalisation of prison regimes because of that shift in the balance of power. But what then happened was during the sort of mid-90s was the POA, backed by the state, the Home Office, decided to start a counter-revolution. Right. So they opened up what was called close supervision centres, or they were really control units. Mm. And what they would then do, they would sort of take people like myself from various prisons, because we were defined or labelled as troublemakers and ringleaders, right. and we were buried into total isolation. Jesus. And then the, the, the guards or the screws retook control of the prisons again. So the balance of power, unfortunately, shifted back. To the power of prison staff, so the brutality and the dehumanization resumed. And I imagine this is something that we can link to what you were talking before when you said um, how important it is to have comrades on the outside supporting mm. you in, in your struggle. Because, mm. it, like we were saying, strange ways haven't got much better. They're still mm. dehumanizing prisoners, they're still dehumanizing, um, mm. you know, anyone involved in the prison system. And if you, if we support people in prisons across the world as comrades on the outside mm. then we can save their image as people and we mm. can sort of you know remind people that these are human beings mm. um you know regardless of the crimes that they've committed yeah. 
Uh, you know, we're, we're talking here about a, a system that is based on punitive justice that has been Ooh. sort of happening for thousands of years. And wow, yeah. shock horror, people still commit crimes. Like, it's almost like it doesn't work. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, so, you know, in terms of like reminding people that there are better options available, uh, I don't know if anyone on Red Planet or our guests are familiar with um, sort of like the Finnish experiment with uh, like low security prisons and, and stuff mm. like that. It's basically a, a, it's just a community. It's not really a, a prison. It's just oh, yeah. basically a. Um, yeah, yeah. There's like a lot of those kind of things. Like, you know, everyone talks about like the Scandinavian uh, countries yeah. and they're like, you know, progressive prisons and all this kind of stuff. But um, one thing that I think is really important to remember about that kind of stuff, because a lot of people think like, oh, you know, over in Scandinavia, they got the right idea and all this kind of stuff. It's yeah. not because of any kind of like, you know, like government and benevolence or anything like that. Like the no. prisons are the way they are in those countries because of because of unions, because of yeah. action, because of yeah. people getting together and clawing yeah. those things yeah. back from them, you know. I mean, also not to yeah. n not like not to uh, say that the say that conditions aren't better or worse, but for my for my money, a prison is still a prison, and I don't find yeah. the, like yeah. I don't find whatever like more comfortable thing, more com more comfortable solution to be like an acceptable solution. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But jo sorry, jo uh, John. I wanted to ask you. Um, you you were talking about like that deliberate targeting of like uh, ringleaders and organizers that you experienced, and I was just wondering if you see kind of a, a continuity between that and the the generalized lockdown now. Like whether it is it this is it the case that like enough people are angry about their conditions and like and wanting a change to the prison system that like that's kind of why they're like locking everyone down because there aren't there just aren't like specific ringleaders they can like do that to or like what do you think oh that's absolutely right i mean I, there wasn't much on the news about it but last week there was a a, a riot right at uh, white Moor, uh maximum security prison and then there was a riot in swellside high security prison and despite the fact that these, these jails are not locked down is what, what effectively happens is they, they still provide you with half an hour's exercise per day. Okay? Right. So they will only maybe unlock, say, 20 of you at a time to spend half hour on the yard. Right. And, you know, these are prisoners that have now been in total lockdown for over two years. And Jesus. And apparently when they came off the yard, they refused to lock up. Right. Um, and the guards fled off the wing um and the prisoners barricaded up the wings and then the right squads came in and then retook the place so there's a real movement of rage happening at the moment in the prison system yeah and the reality is that the guards are now frightened to unlock people in mass mm. because during the lockdown they've been brutalizing prisoners individually because they don't now have to deal or relate to prisoners as a collective group but as vulnerable individuals, this is impacted on the behaviour of most prison staff yep. who frequently go into cells and brutalise prisoners, mm -hmm. uh, starve them with food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the rage has so increased and magnified now during these last two years that they are now frightened to unlock these prisoners as a collective group because it will kick off. And because of the amount of indeterminate sentence prisons that you've now got people doing life sentences or, you know, the people still held under the indefinite detention for Public Protection Act, there are more and more prisoners in this country with nothing to lose, nothing to lose, with no sense of hope whatsoever. And they're in a total position of lockdown and solitary confinement. So you can probably imagine the rage, the despair, and the anger that is now building in these places. Oh, yeah. You know, they're ready to explode the prisons. Mm. I think the problem we were talking earlier on about support groups on the outside, I think the problem, particularly in terms of Britain, is that the left in this country traditionally has never recognised the struggle of prisoners. All right. They refer to them as the lump and proletariat. Right. They don't yeah. see them as an integral mm. part of the working class. Yeah. And they don't recognize the struggle in prison as a legitimate mm. manifestation of class struggle. But the mm. left are going to have to. Yeah. Absolutely. More wise and knowledgeable because a lot of them are going to be going to prison now. Yeah. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> 100%. But also, right. just, I mean, yeah. just also like, um, 
an, an entire system that's built around the suppression of the working class, an entire system that's built around separating out uh, people from the working class who are causing Ooh. like general generally speaking problems for the for the for the way that the the ruling class like extract mm. labor mm. extract value extract like life force Absolutely. from the general population yeah. like the 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 you know the 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 police the prison system all of it like it's it's absolutely absurd to have this view yeah. of of the, of the lumpen proletariat yeah. this idea is is yeah. has always been nonsense yeah, yeah yeah i think it was um like i mean it's it was like a it's it's something that is i think pervasive in a lot of um like older marxist works but mm. i think it was um franz fanon who definitely the earliest that i'm aware of who um talked about like the radical potential of the you know the lumpen proletariat and um yeah and i mean it's like something that i think over here a lot of um organizing groups and marxists are all very tied to prison abolition especially um especially maori organizers because you know we have such a disproportionate incarceration rate it's kind of like aunt, this is uh, one of the main aunt maori main things it's you know? like maori women i think are like the like yeah. proportionally the most imprisoned uh group in the world demographic right? in the world yeah 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 it's wild and um yeah some of my good friends kind of do a lot of um good work in that space and we'll probably get them on as guests soon but, um, yeah. but yeah i think it's like i think it's uh it, it's so like myopic not to be looking at that bigger picture of like okay um you know like i mean i think there's, there's like a angela davis quote about how prisons aren't um you know prisons are about like they say that they're to kind of like help with these social problems but they um they're really just to kind of like hide the evidence of them you know it's yeah. like so you get all these people that are like disenfranchised by you know the system everything is against them you know like and obviously you know like a lot of crime is a result of these kind of um you know like these contradictions mm. and then uh you know and then they just get like shuffled off to jail and it's like we never actually yeah. have to deal with them or anything yeah. like that you know i think i mean i think it's pretty classic of the um of the of, of like uh, the the british attitude and approach to socialism mm -hmm. is always like um where like while um marxists in europe were talking about revolution while marxists in russia were talking about revolution we had uh what is it the, like the i am forgetting the name of the 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 tedious reformists the point is anyway that, <laughs> that like our <laughs> tradition uh, has always been this like this like entirely electoral focused entirely like reform focused mm -hmm. thing that's like doesn't actually interface with like where real re revolutionary potential comes from mm. like i think that i think so much of that probably comes from like how naked and open class warfare is in the uk yeah uh in the news section you know we briefly touched on like the home office trying to re like trying to relitigate hillsborough and like blame blame the hillsborough victims for their own deaths and i think that like people outside of the uk don't necessarily get a sense of just how like openly our ruling class can just despise the working class and like right. so many even just like john said like even so-called leftists in britain will act then like we need to be respectable we need to just like cut off uh, a huge part of the working class who who can't be in the like respectability politics game who who won't win an election or whatever um yeah and i think it's absolutely well like strategically related... it's nonsense Relating to that, um, you know, I looked up the Prison Officers Association before and it followed by Dawn Butler and John McDonnell. So, you know, right. you want to talk about electoral politics <laughs> not being the way yeah. forward. There's, you know, there's your answer in it. Um, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. That's I think terrific. speaking of, um, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, like uh, British leftists not really taking prisoners you know seriously or whatever like that i think that's like i mean that's really wild to me when you consider like especially you know like people like i mean this is just on my mind because i just watched judas and the black messiah the other night but you know you get guys like fred hampton huey p, P. newton bobby seal all you know all these black panthers that were you know incarcerated and they were then you know like put into solitary confinement because they were too effectively organizing with other prisoners inside yeah. the jail you know it's like right yeah, there's this, um, you know, it's like there's, there's, um, I think there's like, you know, like there's a, an energy in there that, um, you know, like the right people can obviously create, you know, like a massive shift in, I would say, like in mindset with people, uh, 
you know, people that are subjected to those kind of conditions and stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I think, I, yeah, well, to well, deny that is like... I mean, I think we've it's been... It's like uh, Malcolm, Malcolm X described prisons hmm. as universities of revolution. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, he was, yeah, exactly. He was there and he... And that's one thing you certainly learn in prison is struggle against the state. Right, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. It is a deeply, deeply politicizing experience. It, yeah, I, I, I fucking bet. Like, it's, you know, Malcolm X talked to... I, you know, Mal, Malcolm X talked about the reason that he joined the Nation of Islam was, like, he was in there and someone came to him and said... Maybe it was his brother, came to him and said, like, um, I can get you out. All you have to do is, like, stop smoking joints and stop eating ham. No, sorry. Stop drink. <laughs> stop drinking and stop eating ham. And he was like, yeah. I don't know what like scam you're pulling, but like, all right, I'll like if it'll get me out. And then like uh, the next thing he did was like give him a bunch of like um, you know black revolutionary literature. I mean, it was it was a nation of Islam, so a lot of it was like not mm. perfect, but like um, <laughs> I, I think I feel like we've been overdue a discussion about like the the the, the concept of the lumpen proletariat and like where it's kind of yeah um, where mm. it's disregarded by a lot of leftists on Red Planet for a while. Yeah. Like I think that you know. A lot of leftists, and this is a huge problem, as we're saying, like in Britain, especially where like this respectability politics has taken such a grip of the left, like especially, I mean, it's it's been a problem for a long time, as I alluded to before, but like especially since Blair and like the attempts to try and join in on like neoliberal consensus politics. But like, I think that for, for, for British, like for British leftists, uh, people like prisoners people like uh homeless people uh addicts alcoholics are treated as yeah like again like the lump and proletariat like they're no use but like i don't know i for example like you know prisoners working together um i don't know for, for my money like alcoholics anonymous is one of the like the biggest mutual aid organizations in the entire world like people right. getting together and helping each other because they can see that like solidarity and recognizing each other's problem and like working on that problem together is the way mm. to deal with it because isolation is the driver of the problem like obviously yeah. Al-Anon isn't like a revolutionary group but like you know it is a mutual <laughs> aid group right and yeah. uh it's just like I don't know M- Mule and I are giving a giving a talk soon uh, at a at like a little commie students group and like one of the things I'm saying in my speech is about how people organize to solve their own problems and what socialists can really lend to that is is like taking it a step further and going like we should you know we should take this and we should make it point towards like deeply changing the way the world works so that the the problem doesn't isn't a problem anymore because like people will just like organize to solve the problem that they're they're confronted with it's just that like it can wind up limited to just like just solving it on, a, on an almost day-to-day basis like the classic issue with like trade unionism is always that like right. they're trying to improve jobs rather than end the notion of capitalist work but like i don't know sorry I, this has turned into a ramble i just think <laughs> i just really i just really think that like um it's the people who face the harshest conditions will naturally start to organize together to to, to address those conditions john does that any of that like useful springboard for any of your thoughts <laughs> or am i just like <laughs> throwing stuff out here no no it, it, it's it's ab- it's absolutely true and it's really amongst the most marginalized and disempowered that you actually find you know the greatest solidarity and collective strength sure. you know um and that's certainly what i discovered in prison um you know, ironically, I was sent to prison to be dehumanized and, and broken. Yeah. What I actually discovered in prison, you know, collectively organizing with other prisoners and creating solidarity was a sense of my own humanity, yeah. you know, for the first time in my life. Hell yes. And, you know, we had this feeling of this collective feeling of humanity and fighting for our rights, whereas the staff, the prison officers were dehumanized by that relationship of power. Yes. Okay, that dehumanized them far more than it did us. So, in fact, you know, prison staff are far more damaged <laughs> by the prison system than prisoners themselves. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's amongst, it's amongst the so called lumpen proletariat, the most marginalized, yeah. that I think the real momentum to revolutionary change will come. The wretched of the earth. Yes, yes. a thousand yes. percent. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, Tim, so, do you have more questions? 
Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask um, in terms of, because I wanted to go back to what I was saying before. I actually agree with both of my hosts and that, like, even though I mentioned the Finland minimum security prison mm, stuff, I yeah. actually a- agree that no prisons are better than that. Um, <laughs> but I wanted I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask um, both of our guests sort of what their, um, you know, ideal sort of idea for the future is. I mean, I, I imagine John, as someone who's been through the system, you can probably speak to this um, a bit more effectively. Like what you would say is the most sort of like um, the best way to sort of treat people who have, you know, basically done things that society is like, hang on a minute, that's not all right. You know, what is the, what is the best way? Um, because for a start, I think most of us here are well aware in on Red Planet that like, you know, uh, if we remove the material needs, for things like you know uh, food and money if if we re- basically just feed everyone clothe everyone and house everyone we're going to see a huge reduction in crimes associated with stuff like that um but what would you say is the the forward sort of like the best what i'm trying to ask you for is your vision of an abolitionist future for prisons basically well yeah i'm a i'm a prison abolitionist uh mm-hmm. the reality is the um you know, people who are sent to prison are made, well, most people, unfortunately, are actually worsened by the experience. Yeah. They're, they're brutalized. In many ways, they're dehumanized. I grew up in the institutional system along with most other long term prisoners, and we sort of be- began our institutional career in places like children homes and reform schools. Yeah. And we were shaped and molded by the system itself into so-called violent offenders or violent criminals. They created us and made us that way. Yeah. So if there is a relationship between the prison system and the safety of the public, it's pretty much an inverse one. Prisons are a danger to the public and a danger to the community, okay? Now, I am an abolitionist, but I tie my abolitionist beliefs into a wider belief about basically transforming society completely, yeah. okay? Mm-hmm. Most people in prison are members of the so-called lump and proletariat from very, very poor, deprived background. There aren't any rich businessmen in prison, all right, or corrupt bankers. They're not to be seen amazingly enough in prison. It really is the poorest, the most dispossessed, the most alienated groups in society. If we truly, truly want to so-called rehabilitate these people, then we have to collectively and positively empower them within the community and create a community strong enough to embrace these people, not lock them up. And I mean, as you, someone said earlier on, it's absolutely true. What prisons are effectively used for is to conceal social problems, mm. homelessness, yes. mental illness poverty, etc. These people are all concealed within the prison system. What we've actually got to do is radically change society and change the conditions that lead to the marginalization of various social or ethnic groups. Mm. And they're ending up in the prison system. Prisons essentially are instruments of social control and repression to maintain the status quo, okay? To maintain the capitalist system, basically. So we need to transform that society before we can truly eradicate yeah. and abolish prisons. I think that's yeah. such a really, really good way yeah. um, of putting it because, of course, that then reminds everybody that this struggle that prisoners have is intimately connected. In fact, mm. you know, intrinsically, yeah, yeah. fundamentally yeah. connected to every other socialist yeah. left-wing struggle um, that yeah. we have. It's like I was yeah. seeing the other day, um, you know, this is, this is how sort of dehumanized prisoners are uh, in the, the verdict of the, the Parkland shooter in, in, in America, in, in the US, and one of the victims' families coming out um, and saying, oh, I wish, I, 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 it was ridiculous, I was, I was hoping that he was going to be killed, uh, I, hope he, I hoped he was going to get the death sentence and stuff like that, and I was sat there thinking, like, how far removed are we? from Mm. you know humanity because you know the cycle of abuse is something horrible happens to you you want revenge for that you Mm. get revenge for that but the trauma remains 
The mm. trauma doesn't go away. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Speaking as an abuse victim myself, mm. I've had to sort of reconcile with my thoughts on like, well, you know, I, in the past, I've wanted my abuser dead, right? Mm. Mm. And then sort of growing up and you get older and you think, well, what would that achieve? Like, what would that get me? Do you know what I mean? Would that get yeah. me justice? Is that justice? Mm. You know, and how do we sort of like actually you know, not just prevent the kind of things that happen to people that induce trauma and abuse and stuff like that, but also how do we, you know, actually remind people that this revenge, this punitive mm. revenge that we all, yeah. for some reason, seek is completely, it's it's mm. it's part of the bastardization of the human experience that comes with mm. capitalism and comes with uh, hierarchies, yeah. just like John says. So I think that that's a, a really, really good uh, yeah. way to put it. I mean, the thing, yeah. I, the thing I'm always saying is that, like, uh, the 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 prison system, the justice system, the concept of crime in a capitalist society is really just like a tally of supposed wrongs that the working class do to each other, right? And you know, and, and to society, and to like, and to the, the realistically to the ruling class, realistically to to you know, to, to, to to profit margins is the most like the thing they're most concerned about policing. But like, um, but like is 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 tre is held up as a tally of wrongs the working class do to each other to tell us that we couldn't govern ourselves if we didn't have a ruling class oppressing us the the entire like the entire mythology that of of, of treating prisoners like scary monsters like you know incurable criminals is is to just to 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 try to tell us that there's some kind of deep basic human element that would always be like harming us and we would have no way yeah. of protecting ourselves from ourselves if it weren't yeah, for prisons yeah. and yeah and that's like the thing right and if you ever try and you know have a conversation about abolition with people a lot of the times the first thing they will do will be like well what would you do with these really oh. bad people you know what would you do to these people <laughs> yeah. that have done this or whatever and i think yeah i mean like that's the thing i think um like i think the best organizations that are um, working around prisons are the ones that are talking about the long game where they're like we are a, you know a radical socialist organization this is a long game and prison abolition is a step to that because then you can answer it you know like um yeah there's a lot of i think there's a, like a lot of people uh now that prison abolition is getting popular or whatever that are starting to consider these ideas but they um you know, it's like when you ask them about like, okay, cool. Well, so what? Um, you know, what? What's the long goal? Because you can't just like shut down prisons, right? You know, Sorry, like just, something's just one, gonna happen. Just, and just, like... just one more brief thing on on, on this before okay. we move on to the kind of the long the long game stuff again. Like, I'm a woman in the UK. The person I'm afraid of murdering me is the police. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the person I'm most afraid of fucking every day is is a cop. Mm. Like, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Tim. I just. Oh yeah, yeah. But just saying, like, um, you know, like, so I think it's important to always include that in the conversation, where it's like, okay, cool. Well, if we, um, you know, living in society as it is right now, or whatever, you know, like, okay, so we know that prison doesn't work. We know that, you know, it's like objectively, like, we can look at it. We can see the facts that people that go to prison, you know, like uh dehumanize and a lot of time they end up coming out and going back right in you know like we know that it's like it's not any any rehabilitation that comes from people in prison is not because of prisons and how they work you know it's because of people inside and because of um you know like yeah networks outside kind of working with people and all this kind of stuff like that so you know like a lot of the time I think it's important. Well, like, I I personally think that it's really important to have these conversations, having like the you know the bigger picture in mind and being like, okay, cool, yeah. So if abolishing prisons is only one step towards building or restructuring society in a way that makes them unnecessary, as opposed to just like closing the doors. You know, because that's what people think when you talk about prison abolition. They think we're just going to close the doors and we're going to let people out in the streets it's like no we're going to create things that will support people to you know like support actual rehabilitation support people to come back to society because the thing right it's like if you're an abolitionist you have to you have to believe that no matter what someone has done that there is a pathway back for them you know like that there yeah. is um and you know it's kind of this thing where you have to believe that 
So all of us are capable of doing really, really great and amazing things, but we're also capable of doing bad things. And it's not that like some people are just like, you know, like monsters or anything like that. It's just that they have been put in a situation or they have been, you know, like conditions have forced them to, you know, to do something, you know, or to do, you know, whatever. And so, um, yeah, I think it's like, it's really important to not just, um, yeah, yeah, you know, like to, to be focusing on, um, keeping in mind, like when we're having conversations and stuff, like never leaving out that kind of like that end game, that bigger thing, because, um, I, I'm seeing a, a, a lot lately with people that are just kind of getting into these discussions and stuff. Mm. And I, this is more like me just like talking to the chat that it's like, this is, um, something you should keep in mind because people will ask you this. Like if you start talking about prison abolition, people are going to be like, well, so what, you're going to let all the serial killers out tomorrow. What are you going to do? And it's like, well, no, like, you know, there's a, there's a bigger thing. There's a bigger conversation that we're having here and a bigger conversation about the way that society is structured, the way that we, um, yeah, the way that we treat people and the way that we, um, serial we killers is such a classic people. one. I've done a lot of reading around, uh, reading, reading around the, <laughs> like, um, John Douglas, the, like, behavioral sciences unit guy and he ends he has like a dozen books now and ends every single one of them with like a, a like an insistence that the death penalty is necessary like it's oh, it's geez, so yes. fucking it's so deeply vile but i think that that's like people just getting into these conversations is is really worthwhile like a, a good thing to point out because in america i feel like a lot of uh, the like really basic baby steps conversations have wound up at this like very mystical attitude toward like native american practices like a lot of people who are just getting into the like conversation are like well we will we'll restructure how justice is done in society because we'll because like native american people used to do like community discussion uh, resolution ways of and they're like incredibly vague when you talk to them about this and it's just like this this Mm. idea that like don't worry the natives have a magic spell that solves it oh, that yeah, means you don't need yeah, to it's, have a like yeah, so and it's we, like no we need to restructure all of society actually yeah, like it's a much deeper problem yeah. <laughs> no yeah we get that a lot down here as well because people will be like well you know like maori never had prisons and all this kind of stuff it's like yeah you're right we didn't but so we also didn't have you know we didn't structure society <laughs> in, you know like a capitalist way we had a yeah. completely different relationship to everything so it's mm. like okay well we can take inspiration from our all the practices and our communal ways of dealing with things mm. but fundamentally we're creating um you know we're creating a new system for a new world sort of thing you know like we can't we can um, we can be inspired by the past but to be like we shouldn't be attempting to recreate the past because i think that's you know fundamentally reactionary and we're yeah, kind of, yeah absolutely yeah. and it is and it is that kind of like um bizarre fetishization of indigenous people as well i'm mm. sure you can oh yeah it's like a lot of noble that. savage stuff that yeah happens there. It's, um, yeah um, like oh we'll we'll just do a you know we'll just do a healing circle and then everything will be fine mm. like it's like what are you talking about like it's so absurd. yeah, yeah. Uh, i wanted um, to ask john um oh my god has it gone out of my head no it hasn't i remember it. it's fine um i was gonna well say done, we, we were saying uh and you were saying that you you know you were saying the wretched of the earth right like that the, there is so much like desire and drive and capability for the most like marginalized people to organize themselves but i was i was kind of curious about how, like how much I, I guess this is for john and matt because you're both in the organization um how much you ever experience resistance from prisoners like i i guess my inclination will be to assume that prisoners are kind of an easy sell on the idea that prison is bad but like <laughs> i don't know yeah. i don't know if there's like kind of a yeah i don't know what what, what what's your experience been right so sorry it's been, just been more concise what, what are you saying what are I'm you so, asking <laughs> sorry about that we we like rambled on for 10 minutes and then i'm asking questions so i i was uh curious <laughs> about like how how much resistance has been within prisoners like just just mm. like prisoners themselves not being down with what you're trying to organize for um i think prisoners instinctively mm. in prison yeah are sympathetic towards resistance collective resistance right mm. because the first reality that you're confronted with when you enter prison is your total disempowerment absolute sense of powerlessness 
and the resulting negative behavior of the people that are guarding you and locking you up. Yeah. So there is an instinctive sympathy and support for any resistance amongst yourselves as a group. Yeah. There really is. Uh, but unfortunately, just like here in the outside world, so called, there are elements among the prisoner population that align and side with the guards. Mm. We used to call them capos. Right. Okay. And the guards would use them in some cases to enforce control and discipline on the wing. Right. And what happened, I suppose, happens over, over the past 10 or 20 years, particularly in the prison system in this country, is that you've had an Americanization of prisoner culture. Yeah. And whereas, you know, we had the solidarity and unity and collective purpose during the 80s and 90s, that was replaced by the gang culture, right. the hierarchy of gangs on each wing of the establishment, which was to the advantage and benefit of the staff who would then virtually subcontract out the control and discipline purpose to the gang leaders. On the understanding right. that they would turn the blind eye to certain activities. Wow. To complete Americanization of, of prison culture. But, and that, that, could, that, that felt really demoralizing, you know, watching that total change in prisoner culture. But having said that, nevertheless, the majority of prisoners are sympathetic and loyal to the concept of collective empowerment amongst prisoners and overfrying the system. Yeah. Well, one thing that's probably worth I can add at this point is that um, one thing we've observed is um, that long-term prisoners are far more responsive to to collective struggle than short-term prisoners. Mm. A lot of short-term prisoners we've found um, just want to keep their head down and 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 serve out their their sentence, you know. Uh, whereas actually, some of the most fertile ground is amongst for, for revolutionary struggle is amongst long-term prisoners because mm. they have nothing to lose, you know. And and there's, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Do, do, no, you're you actually you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So mm. and, uh, that's interesting. It just maps onto that thing we're saying about, yeah, how the most vulnerable and destitute are often the ones yeah. that actually are most, you know, responsive and prone to that, yeah, revolutionary struggle and change, yeah. collective struggle. Absolutely. So I, I think um, that's, I'm oh, sorry. Go, no, go on, Neil. No, I was just going to say, I think that's a really good um, insight to have because, again, if you are talking about advocacy of prisoners, um, you know, from perhaps outside of Prisoner Solidarity Network in, in solidarity with PSN, you know, uh, you might get pushback of people saying like, oh, well, the longest term, of course, because they want to get out because they want to commit more crimes mm. and stuff like that. So I think it's important to have that insight and push yeah, back yeah. On, on negative sort of stereotypes like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that, really, because I think that is such a good insight and such a good, um, and you can only get that insight really from from organising within prisons and and, and yeah. supporting prisoners yeah. on the inside as well. Yeah. yeah. So I've pulled up the uh, the PSN website here, and I, I I was just drawn to the the principles page, and I, I wanted to kind of, if it's okay, I just wanted to read a bit from it and then maybe discuss some of it because I th I think it's really interesting stuff, very well written. And I mean, off off the bat, I, I just agree with them. They're very good. But um, I thought it could be an interesting discussion. So the, the first principle you have on here is that crime and harm are two different things. Some people are convicted of crimes but have not harmed mm. people. Others do great harm to many people but are never convicted of a crime. For example, people can be convicted of crimes for shoplifting or begging, while others are celebrated for polluting the environment and <laughs> exploiting workers. Oh, it's um, so based. Yeah, incredibly based. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I guess, like, yeah the crime and harm are two different things a very good good basic starting principle but yeah. i think like um you know uh i guess if we're talking about prison abolition and reshaping society um it's uh to, on, like a, on a fundamental level the question that winds up um being asked is like well what because the reason that people use like the example of the serial killer right is, is like well what about harm um so yeah. i guess like do you have kind of do you have uh, principles as as an organization about what you think that should be done about harm and like how people who do harm, like what process, what kind of process they should be involved in? Well, I think 
one thing to mention that touches on that thing is when say, what do you do with people that cause harm? I mean, we should really be firing the question back at them. You know, what are you going to do about the people who are working their workers literally to death? Right. What are you going to do about the, the people who are causing ecocide, a level of yeah. ecological destruction that is completely unfathomable to us? And now that that is harm on a scale that when it comes to interpersonal violence, just pains into insignificance. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, and yeah. so really the question of what do we do about harm is a question that people, all of us should be answering about, you know, whether we're abolitionists or not. Mm. Um, and then the other thing I think is also always good to think about when you're asking that question is thinking about times in your own life where you've caused harm. Yeah. So to rather think, dream up some, you know, nice clear boundary about people who've caused harm and people who haven't yeah um actually think about times in your own life uh, that you've caused harm and we've all caused harm in our yeah. life whether yeah. we intended to or not to yeah. and when you think about that and you put yourself in that situation you ask yourself what do, what support do i need in that moment what support did i need in that moment mm -hmm. uh to, at that point where i caused harm and usually you know you think firstly you you needed that help and the support from your community to understand the harm that you've caused. Um, and you also needed the structural conditions that led to that harm being yeah. caused to change so that harm isn't caused again. Absolutely. And let, let's, let's say what we don't need. What we don't need is to have a label tied around our necks permanently for the rest of our lives, labeling us, shaming us with the harm that we've caused. Yeah. Yeah. And then to be ripped away from our community, ripped away from our support network, locked into a room, literally locked in a cage box, dehumanized and brutalized, only to, of course, emerge, you know, surely more likely to cause harm. Yeah. So I think, again, you know, when people, it's, it's so rich of people to throw these questions at prison yeah. abolitionists, <laughs> when really these are questions we need to be throwing back at these people that... Do not forget for the existence of prison. What Absolutely. are you going to do with the harm that's being caused by people who are going to emerge from these horrific institutions? What are you going to be you going to do about the harm that's been caused to them while they're in these institutions? And, yes. and and how are you going to change society to make sure these structural conditions in which harm was caused is going to change? So for me, I hope I'm not dodging the question, but it, <laughs> I feel like this is the way we way we're supposed to respond to that question is to get people to think about harm more generally and, and realize that actually most harm isn't dealt with the criminal justice system. Of course. And when it is, the criminal justice system causes further harm. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. if I could, I if I could add on to answer. that as well, I think, you know, um, additionally, what you said about like thinking about examples in your life where, you're, where you caused harm, I think uh, like be because of the existence of the prison system, so many people think like, so many people think like, I can't have any sympathy or solidarity with prisoners because if I'm if I'm aligning myself with the so-called criminal element, like the, yeah. the the like the authorities will 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 suspect me of something. You know, people mm, pe right. people are aware of like places where they've caused harm in their own lives, and then it's like it's just yeah. a there's the uh, the Fisher quote that's like if the figure of discipline was the worker prisoner, the figure of control is the debtor addict. But like that idea that like the 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 the, the figure of discipline is the worker prisoner. I think it's like we all know that we're capable of harming other people and so like mm. we don't and 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 that keeps us in line because like if if we were to advocate against like punishments for for people who who have done harm we could be suspect of like what harm have you done and it's actually like yeah. everyone is capable of doing harm absolutely everyone and and uh yeah i don't know it, it, it's it's um it's like uh, Foucault's like talking about like the the kind of groups who are treated as like the ones it, it, it's acceptable to do absolutely anything to absolutely anything yeah. whatsoever and you know the un the unity of the concept of crime and harm uh, makes it that like prisoners are treated like that group that we can do that society can do fucking anything yeah. to and like any new law that's making conditions in prisons worse like barely gets yeah. reported on any any changes like you know the, the changes that we've just been discussing uh today so far like how you know uh, it's i'll be honest is the first time like i'm hearing about like the fact that the lockdown is still going on i didn't know that yeah um yeah, yeah. and it's treated as just completely acceptable because like 
because if you are questioning why prisoners would be treated that way like there's yeah. a there's like a suspect nature to that and and i, I think it's yeah. just like we just need to move past the idea that like there are harmful people and then there are like it, completely innocent people who get harmed no it's like it's everyone who right. can be harmed and everyone who does harm Right, um, right. Yeah. And I think that that's a great point to bring up as well, like, because if, if other leftists and other solidarity movements and other abolitionist movements are scared to show solidarity to prisoners, do they not understand that they're already on a list? Like, right. that's yeah. just ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, if, like yeah. if, you've, if you've got some fucking books by Fanon or, you know, even probably Das Kapital, you're probably on a list. You know, yeah. it's just ridiculous to sort of Im imply that, like, oh, you know, we don't want to be associated with these or criminals because we might get told off. Like, it's so bizarre. Um, yeah. And I wanted to launch off that um, and and ask you as both. Um, well, are we still doing the are we still doing the website thing or I, I, can, well, I, can I ask? I mean, if you have a question, question please ask the question. I, I do have a question. Yes, thanks. So, <laughs> so. Um, in terms of like, because I wanted to ask you, like, I think this is a really good point. Like, what kind of solidarity do you want to see from other leftist movements in terms of advocacy and support for prisoners, um, especially Prisoner Solidarity Network? Um, I think it's like the point we were making earlier on. I think we need the left to realize and understand the prisons or the so-called criminal justice system doesn't just exist to target the most major, marginalised or the most scapegoated. They're instruments of social and political repression. And it's in all our interests, you know, to fight the prison system and oppose repressive practices that the police employ or law and order bills essentially designed to quell social dissent and protest. Yeah. We all yeah. have a vested interest in coming together with prisons to fight the prison system. Mm. Because despite, you know, what the media tries to persuade us of, that prisons are full of serial killers and God knows what, mm. no, 90% of the people in prison are petty economic offenders, basically. Yeah. And a growing population of political dissidents are going to find their way into the prison system as well over these next mm. couple of years. Yeah. So the left, the left has got to accept and understand that in order to change this society fundamentally for the good, if you like, mm. for everyone's collective benefit, we have to, we have to overthrow this prison system which yeah. is an instrument of social and political control yeah. to keep societies the way it is. If we truly, truly believe in radical revolutionary change, then we have to instinctively feel support for prisoners who are fighting back against that system from the belly of the beast, if you like. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a spot on answer, to be honest. Yeah, and Ooh. I think that, think that uh, you know, in terms of chat like if you're watching this and you're involved in any organizations i know that i'm going to be sharing this vod uh with the gmtu um and i think that it's really important if you're involved with any orgs to you know tell them about the prisoner solidarity network um and just kind of make that a thing i guess it's kind of like what we talk about in terms of reproductive labor like you know if you're involved in an org and you go to a meeting and you want to you know you see that just the women are doing the washing up and that like you know oh, yeah, get involved yeah. in that like you know just mention you know prisoners like if you've got a meeting and you're talking about for example uh supporting people on picket lines and stuff like that bring it up bring up the prisoner solidarity yeah. network and say are we going to support them in their picket line at like you yeah, know yeah. for example uh i think you had an action outside belmarsh or something like that recently yeah yeah we did support in a prisoner called kevin frackner mm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And what? the prison officers, the prison officers phoned the police hmm. and told them that we were throwing smoke bombs over the wall. Oh my god! <laughs> which was complete bullshit. <sighs> <laughs> They'll just make up anything. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. Jesus. Well, wet. Not yeah, surprisingly, yeah. none of them were arrested for wasting police time. Funny. <laughs> right. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how that works? Yeah. 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 The yeah. um. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I think. I, 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 go on. Okay. Well, I, I just think it's good for people to add 
the kind of abolitionist lens uh, to the way that they look at political mm. struggle and, and the world and, you know, interpersonal yeah. religions and everything. You know, I think for me, that's what abolitionism is. It's, it's a lens through which to look at the world, a bit like Marxism, you know. Yeah. Um, and you can start to look at things differently. And, then, and, you know, for me, a lot of what we, you know, what people are trying to get is change, you know, in the form of reforms. And I think there's reformist reforms and there's abolitionist reforms. Mm. And we want to always be going towards recognizing what are actual genuine abolitionist reforms and ones that are actually just reformist reforms. This is a point I wanted to make <laughs> earlier when you were talking about Scandinavian prisons. Oh, um, yeah. Um, you know, for me, reformist reform versus an abolitionist reform, the, the distinction is very simple. Does it lead to less people being in prison? If right. the answer to that is yes, it's an abolitionist reform. If the mm. answer to that is no, then it's a it's a reformist reform. Right. And, uh, and, and more prisons to deal with overcrowding might sound like a positive thing, you know, it, it, on first hearing of it. But when you realize that every time they build a new prison, they stuff it with people. And, yeah, and yeah. so, you know, that, that, that is a reformist reform. Um, whereas an abolitionist reform might be to decriminalize drugs, to decriminalize yeah. sex work, to, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to abolish landlordism, to, yeah. um, you know, end homelessness, end child poverty, like all these things. And this is the, the thing where you can tie it into to all these other struggles and yeah. recognize that actually, you know, a lot of people working on truth decriminalization are doing abolitionist work. Yeah. A lot of people, yeah, uh, yeah like working on yeah, yeah. under the above sex work decriminalization are doing abolitionist work. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. There was a big yeah. thing down here, actually, because um, down here in New Zealand, we've um, got partial decriminalization of sex work, and there are a lot of leftists that are sex work abolitionists that are like, you know, they they want like the Nordic model or something like that. But then, you know, it's like the way that we see it is that, yeah, so like we were saying before, Maori women are already the most incarcerated right. demographic on earth, as well as being, you know, like the most, like most sex workers in New Zealand are Maori and Pacifica women. So it's kind of like, okay, well, if we, if we decriminalize this, that's, straight off the bat that's like so many less imprisoned maori women every yeah. year you know it's just like an overnight thing you know it's like yeah it's like night and day whereas like you know if we increase criminalization through legalization as opposed to you know decriminalization then that just ends up with more maori women in jail you know right so, exactly yeah yeah I th on on like more prisons to deal with but it's like no what the state's saying is more prisons like and they're always going to do the same yeah. thing with more prisons I, but i wanted yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. about um back on the like i like the separation from like abolitionist politics that so much of the British left is doing. Um, you know, recently we've been seeing like a groundswell of organizing and and like somewhat class consciousness in the UK. And I just wanted to like, I, I was just wondering whether like enough is enough or any of this kind of like current movement of, of like more organized labor and more organized action, like whether you saw any, whether you see any kind of support from them. It's a really good question. I think interestingly that with enough is enough, Mm. Like Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey are, are both, they're both from Irish fam backgrounds, yeah. aren't they? Right. And I think it's interesting. I, I feel like the Irish, especially Irish Republicans, of course, that, you know, they, they like un in, have a little like way into abolitionism because, you know, their community was overtly yeah. criminalized, falsely incarcerated, yeah. you know, um, yeah. Pink thing like the Birmingham was, Six. Yeah, I was over and, in, and they're well over aware in, of that. Uh, I was over in Dublin earlier this year and my, my friend was just sh like showing me like Kilmarnham and like w telling me about his grandfather being there, like hearing his comrades getting like executed, like for, for their parts in like the uprisings. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm, I'm from a community in the Northeast right. that, you know, a lot of, lot of people were, were mining coal miners in, 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 in right. County Durham and, and and you know and that community was criminalised. That struggle was was identified as a political threat to the neoliberal revolution, and um, and many of those found themselves inside uh, prison cells. And I mean, Johnny, you've kind of told me that they're two of the communities that really 
form the backbone of, of a lot of the solidarity you finding prisoners in the kind of 70s and 80s. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, no. I mean, you know, I was in the long-term maximum security prison system during the 70s and the 80s. Um, and one group that was particularly active in terms of organising and fighting back against that system were Irish Republican prisoners of war. And they were at the absolute forefront of, you know, the struggle against the brutalisation of prisoners. Um, the thing is, though, the Irish political struggle was an anti-colonial struggle. Right. Um, and they experienced the brutality of the British state mm. in a very direct, murderous form. And apart from the group that Matt mentioned, you know, the northern mining communities who suffered, you know, extreme repression under Thatcher. Most, unfortunately, the English or the British working class um, don't have that sort of direct experience of state repression. Right. So although there does appear to be a movement developing and growing at the moment, particularly among what exists or remains of the trade union movement, I think it's going to take an enormous leap from that to truly grasp and understand the nature of the state that they're actually fighting and what yeah. that state is capable of doing. Yeah. It's going to take a massive existential jump. But right. it will happen. It will happen mm. because, you know, these new, new anti-protest laws, police bills that are being passed, more and more political activists are going to find themselves in prison. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they are going to understand that the struggle against the prison system is inseparable from the struggle against the state and the ruling class generally. Mm. That realisation will become more and more apparent to the English or British working class, as it has always been apparent to the Irish working class yeah. right. and the multi-ethnic ethnic groups in this country, black yeah. people, etc., who have suffered the iron fist of the state yeah. for generations. So yeah, and so, I think that like, speaks to. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, no, so no, no. Go on, Sophie. Just to con like to conclude that point, like just uh, you're not currently really seeing it, seeing the solidarity from them, but you kind of expect that it will rise in in coming yeah. years, basically. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. I, mean, I think it's a really interesting time. I mean, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the climate activists, you know, you were talking about earlier. You know, some of these people are from like. They went to pro privately educated, upper right. middle class backgrounds, you know, and they're going to find themselves inside prison, man, you yeah. know. And I just think it'll be interesting to see what happens, um, where, where, like if there is a kind of consciousness raising amongst even the middle, upper middle working class mm. um, as this starts to kind of happen. I think it's really interesting. And yeah, you know, I mean, anti trade union laws, you know, are going to get ramped up. It's it's going to get it's going to get nasty. And I think. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've really got a fight on our hands and hopefully with that fight comes a huge lift in uh, class consciousness amongst all people. And, you know, because let's face it, most middle class people are working class in terms of their yeah. relationship to the means of production. Absolutely. In a, yeah. You know, in a yeah. Marxist sense, you yeah. know, and, and increasingly some jobs that historically have been considered to be middle class jobs, these people are on poverty wages. Man, Absolutely, you know, and, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, you look at you look what's happened to the university yeah. sector, you know, in, in, in the oh, very, yeah. very short Absolutely. period of time, yeah. you know, mm. you consider that to be upper middle class. And and now, honestly, these people on poverty wages, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Contract. yeah, it's unbelievable. And, and, they've, earlier, and, yeah. and in my opinion, they've sleepwalked into it because they lack that class consciousness, you know, 100%. And, and now, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I think the UCU is he's got a lot better. Uh, in recent years, and you know, it's it a long way to go, but you know, I, I think, yeah, unfortunately, you know, kind of 15, 20 years ago, I mm. think it, they did kind of just sleepwalk into it, and because they didn't have that class of work, class consciousness. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully that's going to change. Yeah. And, and you know, again, you know, with home ownership, you know, and and again, we don't really could talk about ownership, but it's just security, housing security. That's why people want to own a house. A lot of the time, it's not because they like want to you know rent it out and extract wealth from other yeah. people they just want to fucking live in a in a house and a yeah. flat where yeah. they can yeah. you know not get kicked it. out on a month's notice 
And again, people, upper middle class people, people, you know, from like, yeah, when they're crazy private schools, they're looking at their wages that they're getting. Yeah. And and they're just like, they're just thinking, how is this ever possible? I'm just at the mercy of landlords. I think it's a really interesting time is, is my only point. I, I can't really, I'm not in the business of making predictions, but just, yeah, I do hope that, you know, this the fight brings a, a, a raising in class consciousness. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Tim. you're absolutely right, and I think that like, um, sorry, sorry, Mule, I, I just want to say it quickly. I'll, um, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think that like the 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 concept of the middle class is just a like deliberately divisive lie. Like the the way that middle mm-hmm. like the middle class is like used is just like it it is just like a colonization of the working class and and just an attempt yeah, yeah. to turn us against ourselves and like yeah, yeah, exactly. the, what you're away. saying about yeah. like sleepwalking into it like for me i think the the like education 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 will will like in the long run turn out to be like blair's like accidental like neoliberalism shooting itself in the foot because now there's just like <laughs> so many people who've been run through degree mills who have university degrees and they're and they're like they're either like working in Tesco or they're as you said like working in traditionally considered middle class jobs, but actually like they're getting awful wages, and they're expect they they've been told they should have more from society as a reward, and they're not getting it, right? What were you gonna say, Tim? Um, I was gonna say, uh, yeah, you know, like I think we are in that period of um. I'm born in a period of time where the the contradictions of capitalism are becoming more um, more apparent. You know, like um, like a lot of the um, you know, and like this is happening with like everything from like the climate stuff to you know the cost of living and all this kind of stuff. And I think it's like, yeah, I mean, this is something that a lot of um, I mean, it's like core to a lot of I guess communist kind of revolutionary theory is that as communists, it is our job to highlight those contradictions. Mm. You know, to show people like these these things that are happening like these really terrible things these are because of you know capitalism neoliberalism all that kind of stuff like that so it's kind of like you know like it's it's a really terrible time for a lot of people but it's also really fertile ground for this is you know where we can be organizing with people that you know maybe historically would not be you know like i know um kind of the lower end of the working class is like generally quite um you know, like, fertile ground for organizing and stuff. But then you get these people that, like, had always assumed that they were going to be, like, upper middle class or something like that, and they've never really had to think about class struggle or anything like that before because maybe they came from, like, a, you know, like, a well-off family or something like that. Then all of a sudden, you know, like, some of these, like, kids might find themselves in jail or they might, you know, might find themselves just poor like the rest of us, you know? And it's, like, the times like this where we're going to kind of talk and be like, Hey, look. Well, you know, this is this is why that's happening. You know, and yeah, get that class consciousness back into um into their brains. Yeah, and I think um the the well, I just I just want to point out something regarding how you mentioned before, Sophie, about the or maybe it was I don't know I don't know who mentioned it, but someone mentioned it uh, about the the sort of uh, you know how oh, I think it was Sophie, and it doesn't matter um who like how how class the class uh, system is really intense in this country. Mm. And it's like, you know, middle class people attacking working class people, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I remember I was at a party a while ago. It was like my partner's moving in party or something like that. And I said to someone who's a bit, a fair bit younger than me, I think she was 24, um, that like someone who is now going into like a private job instead of an NHS job, like a, a you know, as, as yeah. a psychologist, as a psychotherapist, is now only earning about 50 grand. Whereas like before they w- would have been earning something more than that, or like 50 grand would have been worth more. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of puts them closer to someone who's earning 20 grand a year. And she blew up. She was like, "That's you, you, how dare you say that they're close to the working class? My dad would would go, you know, would lose his mind if you said something like that." And it's like, "Well, hang on a minute. That is what's happening. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, you know, it's you can't really say that inflation um, is happening and things are getting more expensive, and then expect people to, you know, not see themselves as part of the working class because the the yeah. wages are not being worth as much as what they used to." Um, and that's kind of how pervasive the class system in this society is. So it is you can see just how, I guess, venomous that kind of, um, you know, that class divide is 
uh, amongst people in situations like that. Yeah. But I also wanted to add on to what we're talking about, what what both John and Matt are saying in terms of like, you know, leftists are going to start finding themselves in prison just for being part of organizations. You know, I imagine very, very soon, just people like don't stop, you know, just stop oil and stuff like that. Um, and that is an example of just calling back to things that we've spoken about on previous episodes. That is a callback to revolutionary optimism. Like revolutionary optimism says that the worsening material conditions of the working class under capitalism will eventually lead to the revolution regardless. It doesn't matter yeah. how much organization happens in between now and then. It is guaranteed. And that's just how capitalism works. It's how, uh, you know, the thinkers, the observers of capitalism have looked at capitalism yeah. and how it exploits the working class over, uh, you know, the 200 years that it's been um uh, you know uh, in in power basically that is just gonna happen and it speaks to our message as a as a, as a uh, well i don't know you don't it's a podcast it's a stream our our show you know capitalism is over it's dying and yeah. we have to figure out how we get to the next stage in in you know society the world the next system um i guess as smoothly as possible because we don't want to have a situation where there are loads more people in prisons. Just like John and Matt are saying, we want less people in yeah. prisons. Fundamentally, uh, you know, going towards the end of that to have no one in prisons. So how do we make that as smooth as possible? And I think by supporting Prisoner Solidarity Network, that's a way yeah. that we can support people in prisons uh, in that way, in this sort of, uh, you know in this sort of this route that we're thinking uh where are we time wise we're looking at yeah we're about half 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 past 10 now and i've been trying to remind chat to you know basically think of questions uh and stuff like that think of questions for our guests we've had two questions so far and i don't think that's going to fill up 20 minutes of time it might do i don't know it depends how much you know our guests want to answer so if you've got any more questions start thinking about them uh, and we are going to end. And this, I don't know if this is something that we. Um, th th was this in the questionnaire? I, the questionnaire, by the way, that we sent you and you, Matt and, and John. This is a new thing that we do. Um, so I don't know if it actually says it in the questionnaire about the homework idea. Did you see that? Oh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think vaguely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's something I, like yeah, what, what we what we want them to do or something. Off yeah. The back yeah, of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's not real homework. We we kind of you know disagree with the idea of homework. It, it, you know, in general, it's because our chat are a bunch of swats. They just love it. They just they just that's love what it is. Yeah, they, yeah. they just they're love all nerds homework. and geeks and dorks. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so yeah. If if you have a think about like potentially what we could ask the chat to do, what we could ask the audience to do um uh you know in in relation to your organization as homework just have a think of what you yeah. what you could do it doesn't have to be anything solid we could come up with some uh together if you like later on but in the meantime uh so we've got another question in chat so we might as well well start I would, with the questions I just, wanted to, or... I just wanted to quickly revisit the um yes because you, you talked through a lot of stuff in the in the introduction about prisoner solidarity network but i wanted to revisit the buddy system uh a, like a little bit more first mm -hmm. um could you tell us more about it yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So we have uh, kind of, as our organisation has ex expanded um, on the inside through prisoners talking to one another on the wing about some of the work we've done. We've had um, some support from Books Beyond Bars, who've uh, included us in their newsletter. Um, um, we've had a few. There's a few in reach kind of magazines, newspapers. Uh, newsletters that have have kind of dropped our name and uh, and that's been great for for us for outreach and as as that has expanded our outside members we've been assigning them kind of buddies of people on the outside um, and I, I talked about this earlier you know we kind of part of the function is that you do kind of a form of casework on their behalf but also you know, there there are is in the ground on on the wing. You know, if we're trying to get a grasp on what conditions are like in any given prison, any particular prison, right. you know, we're relying on them to to get that information to us. And also, as I said said earlier, you know, when we're doing our best work, it's really just amplifying the struggles that they're living day in day out. You know, I mean, 
they're the true activists, you know, as I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm repeating myself from earlier, you know, we're, it's not a charity, it's a net tr- network of mutual support and, right. and yeah, the, the people really doing the work of the people on the inside resisting the regimes day in, day out, and mm. we're just here to support them and amplify their voices. So when you say about outside members, are, 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 you, are you referring to uh, ex-prisoners or are you refer- it, it, can anyone kind of be the point of contact? And yeah, and that anyone outside of prison, and mm. and yeah, some of us are, um, are ex ex prisoners. Some of us are not. Some of us are friends and families of people who are inside prison or have been inside prison. Right. And some of us, you know, come to this work through our just intellectual discovery and our ethical values. You know. Um, but yeah, when I talk about outside members, I'm just talking about people outside prison. When I'm talking okay. about inside members, I'm talking about people inside prison. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, uh, then, uh, that, well, that's satisfied my curiosity. Um, <laughs> shall, we, shall, shall we take some questions from the chat, then? Let's do it. Yeah. Cool. All right. So... Do you want to do you want to read the first one, I'll, Tim, okay. or do you want to? Oh, give me stuff. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, sure. I was getting ready. I thought you were going to ask me. Uh, Goat eyed <laughs> asked. I've read that a large portion of the incarcerated population is in jails rather than prisons. Uh, are uh, we talking about like police holding? Uh, that sound, yeah, that and sounds that like an increasing um, yeah. amount of churn of prisoners coming in and out of jails and prisons. I wonder how does this affect attempts at organization? Okay, so I just want to just check in. Does it so is churn the process of like shifting prisoners between like prisons and jails and stuff? Is that what they were referring to there? I think so. I don't know if Goat Eyed yeah. is still here in the chat, but I imagine, um, yeah, it sounds like a, it's, yeah. They're asking about jails versus prisons. Is that, is that like a, an is yeah, that more of an American I, I question? I'm not sure yeah. if this applies. I'm not entirely sure. Sh- should, yeah, should, so should we have a down different? Down here we have a distinction as well, but I'm not. Oh, sure. do you in in yeah Eritrea? So yeah, I imagine um, this is probably. I don't know if you two have any experience with uh, collaborating with organizations in the States or in other countries uh, that you could comment on this about? Limited, but I I mean, my personally, my knowledge is, is of the U S prison system is almost nothing, but um, some of of our members know about the, the American struggle. I mean, if Callum was on this call, he'd be all over this stuff, but um, okay. um, um... But yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just if Gotide is still here, then uh, if they if they could clarify the question a little bit in chat. In the meantime, Tim, do you want to read the next question instead? And we'll, we'll right, the an next answer. one. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, we've got someone. Just Johnny has asked, mm-hmm. "How do we help those that have been damaged and hurt by the prison system?" So I'm guessing that means more like um, people that maybe have come out of prison and um, you know, like maybe need some help kind of just getting back into things like what would you say is a really like oh what are some things that you could do to help someone that is um that has come out of prison is formally incarcerated um yeah what what kind of things do you think would be helpful to kind of get them up and up and going i guess yeah well i, I think the problem that most prisoners experience when they initially leave prison anyway particularly if they spent a long time in prison, mm. they feel totally alienated from society. Yeah. And a lot of them become institutionalized in prison, mm. okay? And find it extremely difficult once released to cope and survive here in the so-called real world. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them are homeless. Um, and yeah, they don't last very long. So you have this sort of, you know, they call it the revolving door syndrome where prisoners come out, they're out for a few days, and then back in they go again. Right. They have no support in the community. They have no true friends or family in the community. And in some ways, many of them find prison, believe it or not, easier than life out here mm. in the so-called real world. Yeah. I think what we need to do as an organisation in the group is to show these prisoners support and solidarity when they leave prison and create a sort of community for them. Because that's desperately what prisoners need once released. The feeling mm-hmm. of being in a supportive community. Yeah. Because if that is not there, these prisoners or ex-prisoners again feel alienated and marginalised 
and fighting their way fairly quickly back into the prison system. Right. Mm -hmm. If we as a group can link up with these prisoners, particularly those prisoners who are fought back against the prison system, yeah. okay? Yeah. If we can provide them with friendship, support, and solidarity in helping the community, that would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's what, you know, it, certainly in terms of myself, uh, you know, the Prison Support Network were there for me as friends and comrades when I left prison. And that was a considerable help, a considerable help. So, yeah, there, there's much that we can do as a group, yeah. John, I think something that I always find funny is that, you know, the thing of probation telling you uh, upon your release yeah. that you, you mustn't hang, he was told, on, you know, you must not hang out with ex-convicts and political activists but, um, oh oh right but, but obviously he found that obviously the, the, the communities that were showing him any kind of solidarity and support that yeah. that would keep him from actually going back inside were of course those two yeah. communities yeah. Yeah. it's almost like they want the system to continue like a cycle oh, yeah, it's yeah, almost yeah. like yeah. they want to keep people inside and yeah, wow well, it's an industry isn't it yeah, yeah, exactly. oh, absolutely. It's yeah, a business. Yeah. Good yeah. lord. Yeah, I think um, there's uh, <clears throat> the gigantic. I think they're actually a British-based company, Circo, that um, oh, they yeah. run a lot of prisons over here as well. Yeah. Um, we have like public prisons, and then we have private prisons run by Circo. Yeah, so and yeah. they make billions of dollars. Yes, <laughs> they get all yes. kinds of um, kickbacks from the government. They get, yeah. and you know, every time there's an um, an inspection. They, you yeah. know, like all the promises that they've made, all the things they're supposed to be doing, you find out they're not doing any of it. There's like inmates Absolutely. eating moldy bread and, oh, you know, people yeah. like dying there and all this kind yeah. of stuff. And like, yeah, there was, I think there was one got shut down in 2016, which was huge. That oh. was like a gigantic deal here. But um, there was like stuff like there was um, some of the screws were ru running a fight club and filming. Oh my the, God prisoners fighting each other and things like that just like ridiculous shit and yeah. um and that was you know this was like a, a a prison that was getting paid literally like you know yeah. millions and billions of dollars to um yeah. to provide this this, this public service that maybe, reminds you know? that reminds me of when i went to the mad pride uh psych abolition event and mm -hmm. uh, we were hearing about um one of the one of the psych wards uh one of the like more notoriously shitty psych wards a bunch of the staff were exposed to running a porn ring like oh, deeply wow. awful yeah. just like deeply oh, yeah. so one yeah. uh, one thing i do want to mention about circo <clears throat> if we're talking about like solidarity uh and stuff like that yeah. circo not only are a private company who have their fingers in the prison system they yeah. also have um you know people working in the health uh sector they have people working in transport immigration defense um you know this is a huge company that is basically yeah, involved in not just the privatization of prisons but the privatization of health services mm. uh immigration services all this kind of stuff so you know if we're thinking about this sort of structure of capitalism and how it oppresses people it oppresses prisoners it oppresses everybody these are these are, this is one of the worst offenders like this company mm -hmm. circo were extremely full yeah yeah absolutely so uh um, final question that we've got here uh from cynthia citrus 2 unless any of the other uh chat members have again uh, go tide if you are listening please get back to us yes okay. uh cynthia citrus 2 says i understand that you support all prisoners but how does your organization support lgbtqia plus and specifically transgender prisoners mm. well yeah i mean uh a lot of our members insider and outside are, are transgender we like part of you know what we've we've done in the past and maybe some of our members are still doing this kind of work in via their bodies is you know sending them um you know makeup clothes things that they need to kind of you know, present as uh, the gender that they are. Um, mm. But yeah, a lot of that stuff goes on. Um, of course, you know, they they kind of become targets uh, by, you know, uh, prison officers. Um, 
it's uh, yeah, it's 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 not it's not good um, uh, for for transgender people inside and the LGBTQ community who've been historically uh, targeted by you know the British state. Even I mean, you know, go, going not even that far back. Um, so yeah, no, that is absolutely part of uh, the what we do. Plenty of uh, LGBTQ plus. Uh, people in our organisation, both inside and out, and yeah, we send our absolute solidarity to to to, to them always. Hell yeah, yeah. I genuinely yeah, love awesome. to hear that. Um... And, and just a, a, a comment on on that, that other question, unless they've got back mm. with more detail. Something yeah. that occurred to me: um, there's a lot of people in prison, about ten percent, in fact, of people in prison right now who who are in prison on remand, and that's. Mm. Uh, when you're you're put in prison before your your sentence. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's like and, over here. It's uh, like you know we call that like the jail, and then you go to the prison or uh, whatever. Yeah, that's probably right. what I, they were referring I, to. I wondered if they were referring to that. And mm. on that, something that's really interesting. You know, you know, you know. Intuitively, you might think that makes sense for some you know particularly violent criminals. You know, quote yeah. unquote. Um, but about 40% of them will either be acquitted or given custodial sentences, which means even on its own terms, on prison's own terms, there's over between two and 5,000 people who shouldn't even be in prison right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people who are in prison on remand. Um, mm-hmm. And as I say, that, you know, there's about 10% of the prison population who are imprisoned on remand right now. And yeah, yeah a good they haven't even been that. convicted or anything they're just waiting yeah, yeah i yeah, my, waiting to be my girlfriend's dad uh went to went to i you know it, it, he was being held while he was like while they were investigating it was for like a council tax bill which i i don't remember the exact details of the story but it was like he he just had paid it like it or it wasn't yeah. even for him it was it was the one or the other and they just had him they just had him locked up in the meantime um yeah it's a really it's a really <laughs> common thing Well, I think those are phenomenal answers um, yep. for some particularly difficult questions. So appreciate that mm-hmm. a lot, Matt and, and John. Um, we're pretty much coming up to the end of the show. I wonder if anyone else... I'm just having a little scan, scan through. Yeah. Um, anyone else who has hosts... any questions, now is your time. Now now you, yeah. is you, you, know, you, ha- you have Matt and John here, so please do ask questions mm-hmm. if you have them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So look, I tell you what, while we're waiting for any final questions, if there are any... Matt and John, what do you think about homework? What can we get our lovely little oh, yeah. sweet chatters uh, to go away and do uh, in order to support prisoners, in order to support the abolitionist movement, or even just prisoner solidarity network itself? Um, well, yeah, I mean, what they should do is, I mean, obviously do a little bit of research around the issue of prison abolition and mm. the prison struggle. And then find organizations and groups who are genuinely, genuinely in support of the prison struggle Mm -hmm. and have abolitionist principles and link up with these groups and become part of a growing movement. And that movement is going to grow. Yeah, I I agree. And I mean, educating themselves um, on prison abolition, the prison struggle. I mean, little plug here, but we've got some good content on our YouTube channel. And if you search Prisoner Solidarity Network, uh, you'll find us on YouTube. You'll find a a collection of videos. Uh, Most of them are me filming John, uh, in some cases retracing his steps uh, around the various various prisons in the UK prison estate and and talking about his experiences and the experiences of of friends of his. Um, We've also got some pretty, pretty interesting kind of, in my opinion, historical artifacts in the, the form of some VHS uh, tapes that I've had digitized that um, of some documentaries that John was actually involved in making whilst he was oh, wow. inside. That stuff's really quite interesting wow. to look back on some of that stuff from the, from the late 80s mm-hmm. and early 90s. Um, and yeah, and we're planning to have, you know, to, to have interviews um, and content like that moving forward. So I mean, that, that's a good, uh, you could do a lot worse than watch some of the, the content on there. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, come on, like there's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, Angela Davis, George Jackson, you know, yep. Asada. I mean, all, all, all this stuff is, it's all good gear 
um, to, to get your to get your teeth into. And and yeah, I re- recommend checking that stuff out. And yeah, try and yeah wear that abolitionist lens and look look at the world through an yeah. abolitionist lens and and apply that to any kind of activism you might already um, already be doing. And yeah, and as John says, you know, get in touch with your if you're really interested and enthused, you know, by by this kind of front of political struggle, get in touch yeah. with your local uh, active you know, prisoner solidarity group. Um, and uh, it may be us, it may be prisoner solidarity network. It may be um, other ones. There's even other groups doing great work in um, uh, in yeah. in London. You know, people like Abolitionist Futures. You know, no more exclusions. Like all these people are kind of doing brilliant stuff and so yeah we yeah it's it's part of a big network and as john says a growing network of people interested in prison abolition so yeah Yeah. that was that my homework a little shout out to me i'm going to be watching a lot of prisoner solidarity networks content on my stream in the coming week mm, no, so there you go right uh because yeah. i found i found this I, found, I saw you i was looking at the notes and i was like oh my god they've got a youtube channel brilliant that's my week sorted like, that, <laughs> i don't have to do any fucking research i'm just gonna watch all of these yeah that's uh, nice. but yeah there's some nice. there's some really good titles here um we've got hmp woodhill a prison within a prison um what else there was one before uh talking about the the uk's guantanamo which is a great title um mm. so yeah i'm gonna be watching that this week so you can Fantastic. just watch your favorite dr Jopter mule uh, <laughs> if you yeah. like or watch it yourself in your yeah. own time and uh as matt says read some of uh those particular authors yeah matt if um yeah, cool. if someone is in london and, wa- and wants to get involved with prisoner solidarity network and what they want to be an outside member uh what's the process for doing that um, I guess just contact us via any of our social media channels. Um, slide into those DMs okay. uh, on, on, on Twitter, on, on Instagram. Uh, our, our email, PSN email address um, mm. should be on the website somewhere as well. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, uh, just yeah, get, get in contact. And, I'm, and just looking, so. I'm looking on the website now, and it says psn at iww.org.uk. Beautiful. Cool. Um, all right. Well, uh, no one else asked any questions. I think that's because you yeah. have such fantastic answers throughout the episode already. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, I've been enthralled. So, um, yeah, I think thank you for joining us awesome. so much. And, um, yeah. if there's any other like organizations, you, you already mentioned abolitionist futures and no more exclusions, both of which are groups we're hoping to have on the show in due time. Uh, so if there's anything else that you want to shout out before you head off, please do. Um, yeah, otherwise, thank you for joining us. Oh, John a blank. Yeah, sorry, John a blank. On <laughs> Absol- absolutely no worries. Yeah. Nah, you've no, done you've so well. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, in, actually, do you know what? In- Inquest do great work. I okay. mean, the, the, I mean, in the wake of uh, the, the, the murder of uh, Chris Kerber, um, right. there's, there's a great group called uh, Inquest who do really good work trying to get uh, truth and justice and accountability for um, people who's friends and family have, have died in police custody. So yeah, oh, big shout out to wow. Inquest. Cool. Um, they do really good work and are, are really stepping into gear over this uh, Chris Kerber thing. I think it's it's vital, vital right. work. So, yeah, please support okay. um, Inquest. Yeah, again, thank you so Phenomenal. much for joining us. Yeah, I've cool. really enjoyed thank having you. you on. And uh, yeah, despite the horrific tech problems we had earlier, Matt, I think that you smashed it. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks, thanks so much. No, honestly, solidarity to all of you. It's been great to chat, and uh, and yeah, brilliant. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll be tuning into some other episodes. Thanks Aww, so much. Thanks. Uh, all awesome. Right. Cool. Goodbye. Have a great night. Thanks, See um, you later. Yeah. Oh, I think everything will have rearranged badly. Yep, it has. It's okay. rearranged badly. It's um, oh my god. Someone be entertaining. Tim, tell some jokes while I quickly rearrange things back again. Um, uh, I don't have any jokes, but um, I was going to say for anyone that is down here in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, an awesome organization that um, I am involved with and a lot of my friends are very heavily involved with in is, um, is called PAPA, People Against Prisons Aotearoa. Uh, they do some really, really incredible work. I'm going to link their little URL. Emmy on the show, and, when? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, we're trying to sort it out. She needs to actually get like a proper 
home microphone setup Makes and sense. stuff, but I actually have a spare one, so I'm going to see if, right. um, if that would be good. Um, and there's also, actually, there was a really good um, video that she did a, a video interview. I'll find it, um, and I'll put the link in the chat as well. It was part of um, this um, comedian that kind of does a series where kind of talking about social issues with different people every week and um and so she had on um emmy who is the the spokesperson the, the press person for um for papa and it was really good because they spoke to her and they also spoke to another comedian who has been in prison so a formerly incarcerated person wow um and then also a um a guy jeremy lightfoot who is like the head he's like a big you know he's a ceo of a prison right basically wow. and um so it was really good because uh so the host i think her name is alice would be asking questions to this guy and he would be giving these really kind of like liberal kind of platitude answers and stuff and i mean like he come he does come off really well but then it would immediately cut to emmy just basically explaining like oh well actually no this isn't what happens or like this is an example <laughs> of them not doing this you know so it's it yeah, really that sounds good. like um, emmy that's pretty fucking good <laughs> yeah 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 no, she fucking nailed it and um so cool. it's, it's a really good watch because it kind of um debunks a lot of the nice. the myths that um you know like a lot of these kind of people running modern prisons they yeah. try to appear like they're kind of yeah. you know being really progressive or whatever um yeah i, I think that's something, link, that's though, something I mean, uh, emmy's told me about before is the way that especially the new zealand pol uh, police uh are really good at like trying to run like um very PR. good at their optics yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah incredibly um, good at it yeah i can't recommend uh, people against prisons aotearoa strongly enough and uh it's just just emmy as a person just like check check out emmy she's great um i yeah, fixed yeah, everything we'll now so so let's Let's ask the really important question, which is, if someone was wondering about this this beautiful man, Donald Donald Mule, and where oh. they can find him, what, what's he about? What's the deal? He's so mysterious. Oh. He's so interesting. Uh, what, what? Where can people find more of you? Fucking hell! Here I am. I'm coming out of the mist. That I'm like a, an enigma. I'm shroud. I'm like a. <laughs> I'm a ghost, which I believe in. Uh, no, anyway, I, 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 me, Doctor Doctor Mule. You can get me. At, <laughs> at Tim, love that. Uh, DJ Mule on everything, pretty much. It's DJ Mule on DJ Twitch. Death Jock Mule. That's right, DJ Death Jock. That's my <laughs> uh, last minute Halloween name. I thought, what am I? I'm a kind of a jock, sort of. Uh, and uh, death is scary. So there you go. There's my Halloween name. Uh, so that's it, DJ Death Jock Mule. Uh, listen, it's been way too confusing. DJ Mule on YouTube, on Twitch. I'm a leftist streamer. I do political commentary, uh, have a little joke, look at weird guys in woods. Not done that in a while, so probably going to do a bit more of that. I was watching some goblin um, content on my stream. No, some gnome content, actually, on my stream the other day. Content. It was yeah. it was a TikTok you sent me. It was the, it was the light language act uh, gnome activation. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted oh, yes. everyone to see it. It was so good. I need to see that because I've been seeing some hilarious light language activation videos and if there's some if it's a crossover with a gnome fandom that's what i want to oh it's good yeah there's a lot it's... of crossover oh yeah it's, it's yeah. so need, crusty uh, yeah. Oh. Me. But, um, it's yeah so. i'll send you i'll send you that tim because <laughs> fuck me i've not laughed in a long time um so anyway yeah, it's uh, yeah. So that's that. You can get me on YouTube. You can get me on Twitch. If you want to get me on Twitter, DJ Mule with an underscore at the end. Uh, but I, listen, I'm handsome, like Sophie said. I'm all right. You know, maybe a seven. Uh, it's subjective, isn't it? But Tim is just all round. Like you can't say that Tim is not an eleven out of ten. If not so a twelve. This is a twelve. He's a fifteen. A bajillion. Uh, out of 10. Tim, where where can anyone see more of your wondrous visage? Um, so, Twitter is probably where I am, like, most active. Uh, so, you can find me over there as Dread Conquest, or you can find me on Twitch and YouTube as Conquest of Dread. Um, I haven't been streaming too much lately, but um, I feel like I just need to find the right game to stream. So, you know, like, my... Um, Stream schedule is very sporadic. It, you know, I get passionate about a game and then we'll stream it every night until I beat it and then not stream for like a month. So, you know. Um, but yeah, so you can uh, check me out over there. 
uh, pretty easy to find. Um, but what about um, our good friend uh, Kira Chats? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you said it. It's Kira Chats, right? So it's it's Twitch.tv slash Kira Chats. And more importantly, at the moment, that is where Red Planet streams usually are. So if you have come through, uh, if you, especially if you're one of Purin's Raiders, um, and you want to see more Red Planet, don't come here every Sunday, 8 till don't 11 p.m. UK time. Do, do not it. do that. Go to twitch.tv slash Kira Chats. In fact, if you are a raider right now and you, you're just learning about Red Planet for the first time and you want to see more, go over there right now and follow so you get the notifications. Twitch.tv slash Kira Chats. Uh, if you tune into some of her regular streams, uh, her Nightbot also links to her other stuff that she does that we can't talk about mm. on Twitch, but it's good. Check it out. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, Cool, and I, I mean, I'm already here, so I don't, I don't really need to tell, pe- tell people. I, you know what? I will tell people to go to patreoncom slash Sophie from Mars because I have lost a lot of income over the last few months not releasing anything. Because the cool thing about my job mm. is there's no sick pay, and so uh, yeah. please go to patreoncom slash Sophie from Mars. I'm gonna jump off the call really quick and pick someone to raid, and then I'll jump back in so that Conrad can tell us how to do the show better. Uh, see, see you guys <laughs> in a in a mo. Bye. See you in the mail. Goodbye. Right. See you later. Hey, everyone. It's just me for a minute. Uh, while I move the Streamlabs to the other uh, screen, and while I open up Twitch.tv and see who's streaming at the moment. Um, we're going to pick someone to raid. What a great episode that was. I thought that was really good. I, th- I think that went really well. Honestly, I think I say this, like, too often. <laughs> but honestly, like, one of my favorite episodes that we've done i really loved matt and john great answers they gave to absolutely everything i think that was just like a just a beautiful time uh we met them mule and i met john at um an abolitionist's picnic so just like uh just a a perfect place to send an undercover cop like me um (laughs) why did i say that um i've blown my cover uh and there was there were a bunch of other great abolitionist groups there um so i'm really hoping that we can get more of them on the show in the next few weeks or like you know next few months basically uh because there's yeah i mean abolition is just a really important topic not just like prison abolition but psych abolition the general dismantling of like a punitive mindset that we take uh, for those who are familiar with psych abolition it's, as in the, the the psych ward system which is just deeply inhumane and horrible as i kind of touched on a minute ago but like um cool i found someone to raid um <laughs> So, um, that was great. I'm looking forward to future episodes with more people we met from that picnic. And, uh, yeah, if you enjoy Red Planet, twitch.tv slash Kira Chats, 8 to 11 p.m. UK time. I forget the conversion to other time zones, but I, I trust in your ability to use Google and figure it out. You are smart cookies. Check out, uh, the Red Planet Patreon as well. Oh, shit, I've just been reminded very last minute by Nat that we have a Patreon and you can support the show and help us to pay our producer and make the show even better and expand the show and make it amazing. Uh, if you go to patreon.com slash red underscore planet, please do that. Please become goblin mode. Please become sicko mode. Uh, it's all, it, it, it'll help. So do, do it. That would be great. Thank you. And now we're going to raid into James Stephanie Sterling, my good friend, uh, the Pangalactic Princess of Pandemonium. Let's go. Fuck that game.